Welcome back to Tampa City Council. I'd like to call this meeting to order. If we can have roll call, please. Carlson. Here. Kurtet. Clendenin. Here. Anderson. Present. Vieira. Here. Miranda. Here. And Maniscalco. Here. We have a physical form. All right. May I have a motion to open all public so hearings? So moved. We have a motion from Councilwoman Henderson, second from Councilwoman Miranda. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Let's go to item number 62. We'll go into second readings, and then we'll go to the firefighters. Yes, ma'am. Yes, Item number 62 is the second and final public hearing for a proposed brownfield designation of the Ebor Gateway Redevelopment Area, generally located at 1306 East 4th Avenue. An application has been submitted to the City of Tampa requesting a designation of these properties as brownfield area to assist in the assessment and remediation of environmental impacts that may exist on the property. Details of the designation have been outlined in a document entitled Staff Report on Ebor Gateway Redevelopment Area Proposed Brownfield Area Designation, which is available for public review in the Clerk's Office and in Sire. <clears throat> City staff has determined that all statutory and public notice requirements have been met and recommend that Council approve this designation. At the conclusion of this second public hearing, Council will have an opportunity to pass a resolution designating Ebor Gateway Redevelopment Area as a brownfield area as specified in Chapter 376 of Florida Statutes. Staff and I and the applicant's representative are available if you have any questions. Do we have any questions? No? Do we have anybody in the public that wishes to speak on item number 62? No one is registered? Second. Do we close before we read the resolution? Yes. Okay. Motion to close from Councilmember Clendenin, second from Councilmember Miranda. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Councilmember Miranda, would you mind moving this resolution? Uh, yes, sir, I move the resolution. We have, we have a second from Councilmember Henderson. Roll call vote. Carlson? Yes. Kurtet? Clendenin? Yes. Henderson? Yes. Vieira? Yes. Miranda? Yes. And Maniscalco? Yes. Motion carried unanimously. We're her tech being absent at vote. All right. If you are here to speak on any of the uh, public hearings that are quasi-judicial, please stand, raise your right hand, and we will swear you in. All right. Please proceed. Yes, ma'am. Um, thank you, Chairman and Council. LaShawn Dock, Development Coordination. And um, Council, item number 63 is REZ 2328. This item is before you this, today for um, second reading. This is for the property at 3707 and 3709 West McKay Avenue. The request was to rezone the property from R01 Residential Office to PD Plan Development for residential single family attached um, uses. Um, the site plan has been certified and provided to the clerk. And um, again, this is before you for second reading and adoption. I'm available if you have any questions. Do we have any questions? All right. Do we have an applicant for item number 63? Yes, sir. Uh, good afternoon, Council. Steve Michelini representing the petitioner. Uh, there's a bonus provision also attached to this which requires your action. I respectfully request your approval. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Do you have any questions for the applicant? Nope. Do we have anybody in the public that wishes to speak on item number 63? No we have nobody registered. Do we have a motion to close? So we'll motion okay. from Council Member Miranda, Senator from Council Member Clendenin. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Council Member Vieira. Yes, sir. Um, I move an ordinance being presented. Presented for second reading and adoption ordinance rezoning property in general vicinity of 3707 3709 West McKay Avenue in the city of Tampa, Florida, more particularly described in section one from zoning district classification RO, uh, one residential office to PD residential development residential, single family attached, providing an effective date. We have a motion from Councilmember Vieira, second Councilmember Henderson. Please record your vote. Uh, yes, sir, go ahead. I just want to explain my vote. I'm going to vote in favor of this, but I want to explain why. Oops, sorry. I want to explain what I thought it was being tricky today. I'm going to vote in favor of this. I want to explain why, because you know, every, every people know about how I feel about PDs. This, this particular parcel is in a very mixed use, highly commercial area. Um, little to zero impact on residential <laughs> units around it. Um, I think the market will dictate whether it's a good project or not, and that's necessarily for me to make that determination. And uh, so that's why, because it, it has no impact on residential properties around it. Thank you. Or little impact on it. All right, record your vote. Thank you very much. Motion carried with Carlson and Hertek voting now. 
Thank you, Council. Yes, sir. And now may I have a mo motion to move the resolution? Motion from Councilwoman Henderson. Do we have a second? Second. Second from Councilwoman Miranda. Uh, roll call. No. Voice vote. Go ahead. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Negative. Motion carried with Carlson and Hertek voting no. Thank All you, right. Council. And I'm going to abstain from item number 64. I have form 8B to receive and file, and I will hand it over to to the clerk. Uh, I live I live near right near there. So, yeah. And Mr. Chairman, I, I can see it yeah. from my front door. If there's any question of conflict. Yeah. Okay. And Mr. Okay, Chairman, so, uh, we, yes. I'm sorry. May I, Martin Shelby, City Council Attorney, and also for the purposes of the record, um, if the um, if the agenda could uh, be amended to reflect or, or somehow the record be amended, the minutes to reflect that at the first reading um, on August 17th, um, it doesn't appear on the agenda, but just for the purposes of the public and today, uh, you did abstain at the first reading of this Yes, evening. sir. I walked out of the room and I did a, mentioned it publicly, so if that could be corrected. All right. Can I get a motion to receive and file? So. Motion from Council Member Vieira, second from? Second. Council Member Hertak, all in favor? Aye. Aye. See you later. Okay. Yeah, I have to walk out of the room. Okay, so we're on uh, item number 64, and we have a staff report. Yes. Thank you, Council. LaShawn Doc Development Coordination. Item 64 is REZ 2350. It's for the property located at 2529 West Curtis Street. The request is to rezone the property from RS50 residential single family to RO residential office. Um, this item is before you today for second reading um, and adoption. This is a Euclidean zoning, so there is no site plan associated with this request. I'm available if you have any questions. Any questions? Thank you. Thank An you, applicant? Counsel. Applicant representative? Good afternoon. Truett Gardner, 400 North Ashley Drive. Uh, this received a 4 2 vote before Euclidean, so straightforward. Um, two concerns that were raised one pertaining to a sidewalk, just wanted to come in on the record, even though it's not a PD that that will be provided. There were also some transportation concerns raised. We, as a show of good faith and at the direction of our client, have continued to work on that. And Addie Clark, our traffic engineer, is here, and she can report on kind of what those conversations have been with transportation staff and where things hopefully will go from here. Okay, go ahead. Good afternoon, Addie Clark, 400 North Ashley Drive. So as Truett had said, we had spoken with transportation and mobility staff prior to first reading, um, knowing that there were some concerns about traffic. And after first reading, we again met with city transportation and mobility staff um, to bring attention to this area. And we're happy to report that as of late last week, the mobility department was going to be looking into this area again further. Um, again, this project is de minimis in terms of number of new external trips. Um, and the city's previous speed study reported that there, were, there was not a speed issue, um, but we're thankful to have had brainstorming in, uh, sessions and multiple discussions with the city staff um, due to Dr. Cantu's effort to be a good neighbor. So. Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Is there anybody from the public here to speak on this issue? No Nobody's registered. Hearing no one, do... We're closed. Well, we have a motion to close from Councilman Miranda, a second by Councilwoman Henderson. And let's have a, oh, I'm sorry, all in favor of closing debate, aye. say aye. And opposed? Okay, debate is closed. So Councilwoman Henderson, would you please read it? I move file number REZ. Thank you, Councilwoman. I move file number REZ-23-50, an ordinance being presented for second reading and adoption an ordinance rezoning property in the general vicinity of 2529 West Curtis Street in the city of Tampa, Florida, and more particularly described in section one from zoning district classifications RS50, residential single family to RO, residential office, providing an effective date. Second. Okay, we have a motion from Councilwoman Henderson, a second from Councilman Miranda. Would you please record your vote. Motion carried with Carlson and Hertek voting no and Maniscalco abstaining. Thank you so much. Yes, ma'am. Um, thank you, Council. LaShawn Doc, Development Coordination. And Council, item 65 is REZ 2349. Um, this item is on the agenda today for second reading, um, but this item 
for this particular application. At the time of application for the rezoning, um, the applicant applied to have an address change to the property. That address change occurred during the processing of this rezoning. The original ordinance had the old address on it. So what is before you now is first reading. Um, and you have a substitute ordinance that has been provided um, with the correct address on it. The applicant has also agreed to make the change between first and um, second reading um, to the site plan to put the correct address on the site plan also. So this is for, um, just for the record, this is for the rezoning. This request was to rezone the property from PD to PD, plan development, and it's for residential multifamily use on the property. So this would be your first reading, and then we would have second reading. Okay. And I'm available if you have any questions. So we would read the substitute. That's listed the substitute. Here, correct. Yes. Okay. Um, all right. I see 4502 McCoy instead of the trash. Correct. Okay. And if all I right. can, just to it, it says that the substitute is being presented for second reading and adoption. That would have to be. First. That's the way it appears. It appears it's for first reading. So whoever reads it, yes. just please know. First. Yeah. first reading. Yes. Okay. Please. Any questions? All right. Do we have an applicant here for item number Thank 65? You, yes, ma'am. Good afternoon, Cami Corbett with the law firm of Hill Warner Henderson, 101 East Kennedy Boulevard, Suite 3700. I'm just here if you have any questions. Any questions? Do you have anybody in the public that wishes to speak on item 65? No one is registered. And no one is registered. May I have a motion to so close? close? Motion to close from Councilmember Miranda, second Councilwoman Henderson. All in favor? Aye. 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 Councilman Clendenin, I believe it's to you, correct? Uh, yes. If you could read the yes, substitute exactly. and make sure to mention that it is a first reading. Right. So an ordinance being presented for first reading and adoption, an ordinance rezoning property in the general vicinity of 4502 West McCoy Street in the city of Tampa, Florida, and more particularly described in section one from zoning district classification PD plan development to PD plan development, residential multifamily providing an effective date. Second. We have a motion from council member Clendenin, second from council member Vieira, all in favor, roll call the vote. Yes. Yes. Roll call. yes. Clendenin? Yes. Henderson? Yes. Vieira? Yes. Miranda? Yes. Carlson? Yes. And Maniscalco? Yes. Motion carried unanimously. Second reading and adoption will be held on October 5th, 2023 at 9.30 a.m. All right. Yes, ma'am. Item number 66. Yes. Thank you, Chairman and Council. LaShawn Dock, Development Coordination. Item 66 is REZ 2362. Um, this is for the property at 3204 West Cypress Street. The request is to rezone the property from RS50 Residential Single Family to CG Commercial General. Um, this is a Euclidean um, rezoning request, so um, there is no site plan associated with this request. This item is before you today for second reading and adoption. I'm available if you have any questions. Any questions? Do we have an applicant for item number 66? Thank you. Mr. Brickemeyer, were you, do you have, if you don't have anything to add, but were you sworn in? No, let's. Yeah, Mr. Berkemont, please uh, turn on your camera and unmute yourself, and we'll swear you in. Can we continue? I mean, there's, well, he is absent that vote, but it was unanimous. Mr. Shelby, can we continue on? He is online. But he stepped away from the camera. But he stepped away from the camera. Does he have, do we know whether he has anything that needs to be said at the second reading? I mean, it was unanimous with one absent voter, so, and there was nobody here. I suspect you can, and if he does have an issue with that, he can always request that council Oh, back, although actually there is I mean, no if it gets approved, it gets approved. Is this, the, is this the last one or are there others we can skip no, to? No, this, uh, this is the second reading. This, this, yes, but how many more after this do we have? Uh, of his, I don't, yeah, we have, no, we have four after this. Yeah, so maybe perhaps we can skip this one and see if he comes back. Yeah, if there's nothing else. No, the thing, okay. Oh, we should go read. ahead, go Sometimes ahead and do it. Sometimes we don't have an applicant. That's true. Any questions okay. by council members? No. Is there anybody in the public that wishes to speak on 66? No one's registered. We'll Can close. I get a motion to close? Motion to close for uh, Councilman Clendenin, second Councilman Miranda. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Councilwoman Hurtak, if you wouldn't mind reading 66. Thank you. Uh, file number REZ 23-62, ordinance being presented for second reading and adoption, an ordinance rezoning property in the general vicinity of 3204 
West Cypress Street in the city of Tampa, Florida, and more particularly described in Section 1 from Zoning District Classification RS50 Residential Single Family to CG Commercial General providing an effective date. Second. Move a second. Second from Council Member Miranda. Please record your vote. <coughs> Motion carried unanimously with VRB and absent at vote. Uh, I just want to, you know, say about the approval. I mean, what is he going to say? Item 67. Thank you, um, Chairman and Council LaShawn Dock Development Coordination. Um, item 67 is REZ 2364. is for the property located at 5232 South McDill Avenue. The request is to rezone the property from CG Commercial General to PD Plan Development for the use of a restaurant. Um, Site plan modifications were required to be made between first and second reading. Those changes were made. The plan um, was certified and um, provided to the clerk. And this is before you for second reading and adoption. I'm right. available if you have any questions. Any questions? Mr. Manassi? Oops, sorry. Good afternoon, Council. Ryan Manassi, Johnson Pope, 401 East Jackson Street. I'll just reserve any time for any questions and respectfully request your approval. Any questions at this time? Do you have anybody in the public that wishes to speak on item number 67? No one is registered. We have a motion closed from Council Member Clendenin. Do we have a second? Second. Second from Council Member Moran. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Council Member Carlson, would you mind reading item number 67? Yes, sir. Um, move file number REZ 23-64. Ordinance being presented for second reading adoption. Ordinance rezoning property in the general vicinity of 5232 South McDill Avenue in the city of Tampa, Florida. And more particularly, described in section 1 from Zoning District Classification CG Commercial General to PD plan development restaurant providing an effective date. We have a motion from Council Member Carlson. Do we have a second? Second. Second from Council Member Hurtak. Please record your vote. Motion carried with Miranda and Henderson voting no and VR being absent at vote. All right, item number 68. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Council. LaShawn Dock, Development Coordination. Item 68 is REZ 2365. This is for um, the property has a folio number of 102910 and four zeros. This is property on Church Avenue. Um, the request is to rezone the property from RS50 residential single family to PD plan development, and it is for the use of residential single family detached. Um, and certified site plans have been provided to the clerk. There were modifications to be made between first and second reading. And this is before you today for second reading. All right, any I'm questions? available if you have any questions. Thank you very much, Thank applicant. You. Good afternoon, Council. Steve Michelini, representing the petitioner. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Any we questions? All right. Do we have anybody in the uh, public that wishes to speak on item number 68? No one is registered. No one is registered. Motion to close for Councilman Clendenin, second from Councilman Moran. All in favor? Aye. 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 Councilman Moran. Thank you, Chairman. Item number 68, file number REZ 23-65. An ordinance being presented for second reading and adoption of ordinance rezoning property in general vicinity of folio number 102910-0000 in the city of Tampa, Florida, more particularly described in section one from zoning districts classification RS50 residential single family to PD plan development residential single family detached providing an effective second. Date. We have a motion from Councilmember Miranda, <coughs> second from Councilmember Vieira. All in favor? Aye. Wait, I'm sorry. Ro please. Uh, Please, uh, you know, push in your vote. Yes. Push your buttons. Mm -hmm. Motion carried unanimously. Thank you, Council. Thank you very much. Item number 69. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Chairman and Council LaShawn Dock, Development Coordination. Item 69 is REZ 2377. It's for the property located at 3917 North Nebraska Avenue. The request is to rezone the property from PD Plan Development to CG Commercial General. Um, this is a Euclidean um, rezoning, so no site plan is associated with this request. And it's before you today for second reading and adoption. I'm any, available if you have any questions. Any questions? All right, applicant. Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon, Addy Clark, 400 North Ashley Drive. Here if you have any questions and we respectfully request your approval. Thank you. Any questions at this time? Is there anybody in the public that wishes to speak on item number 69? Motion to close. Nope. Motion to close from Councilmember Member Clendenin, second from Councilwoman Henderson. All in favor? Aye. Councilman Vieira, it's you? Yes. Yes, sir. 
Move an ordinance presented for second reading adoption. An ordinance rezoning property in the general facility of 3917 uh, North Nebraska Avenue uh, in the city of Tampa, Florida, more particularly described in section one from zoning uh, district classification PD plan development to G or CG commercial general providing an effective date. Second. We have a motion from council member Vieira, second from council member Miranda. Please record your vote. Motion carry unanimously. Yes, ma'am. Item number 70. Thank you, Chairman and Council. LaShawn Dock Development Coordination. Item 70 is REZ 2379. It's for the property located at 3119 West San Pedro Street. The request is to rezone the property from RM16 Residential Multifamily to RM18 Residential Multifamily. Um, there is no site plan associated with this request. It is a Euclidean rezoning. Thank and you very I'm, much. I'm available if you have any questions. Any questions? Uh, Thank you, Council. Mr. Bricklemeyer, I see you on camera. We already approved your, your project. You have nothing to worry about. And then he's gone. <laughs> just like that. Not even a good vibe. He just ran off. You're, you're good. You're good. Thank you very much. Have a good afternoon. You're, you're all set. We already approved you. Yes, sir, Mr. Michelini. Uh, Steve Michelini, representing the petitioner. We respectfully request your approval and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions? All right. Do you have anybody in the public that wishes to speak on item number 70? Motion closed. So move second. Motion closed from Councilmember Clendenin. Second, Councilmember Miranda. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Councilwoman Henderson. I move file number REZ 23 79, an ordinance being presented for second reading and adoption. An ordinance rezoning property in the general vicinity of 1339 West San Pedro Street in the city of Tampa, Florida, and more particularly described in section one from zoning district classifications RM16, residential multifamily to RM18 residential multifamily providing an effective date. Second. All right, please. Re we have a motion from Councilwoman Henderson, second Councilwoman Miranda. Please record your votes. Motion carried unanimously. All right. Thank you, Council. Thank you very much, sir. And as promised, we will go to police and fire rescue regarding an action plan. We have some representatives here from police and fire. Councilman Vieira. This uh, is your motion. You yeah, like uh, and, I'll, and I can speak after they're finished. I mean, there's nothing to. I'll, I'll talk after they're finished if I may. All right. Who would it, whoever would like, uh, whomever would like to begin. And I know we have members from the uh, fire union that have been waiting patiently in the back. If they wish to speak as well after yeah, the right. fact, they will be welcome to. So, okay. go ahead, sir. All right. Uh, good afternoon, council. We do have a PowerPoint. Yes, sir. We see it here. There we go. Okay. So our team worked uh, extremely hard on building out a strategic communications plan. This is a vision and a guide for us over the next five years. We've outlined goals and strategies for us to achieve those goals. Due to the length of this document and our actual strategic plan that this PowerPoint highlights, we have sent you advanced links. I don't know if you've had time to review them. Um, so we have that as a PDF plan and we have a PowerPoint summary. We've already met with the PBA, uh, had a review of this, and we're all in agreement on our vision and outline for the next year and the next five years. So today, uh, both Deputy Chief Johnson and I will go through the PowerPoint somewhat quickly and uh, see what questions you might have for us when we're finished. Yes, sir. All right. So the mission of our department is very clear. It's up here. It's to reduce crime and improve the quality of life and it's not just alone, and we talked about it this morning in some of the awards that we did. It's a cooperation with all the citizens. So that kind of outlays what everything we do is wrapped around our mission. In addition to our mission, we have our core values, which some of you may or may not be aware of, but the acronym is TRUST, and that's Transparency, Respect, Understanding, Safety, and Teamwork. And of course, the us and us working together. We say constantly there's just under 1,000 officers and nearly 400,000 citizens. We can't do this alone, so we stress the importance of that. So now talking about staffing and to the officer-citizen ratio, some of this may be a repeat for our budget presentation, but uh, we're estimating the population at roughly 400,000, and right now we have an authorized strength of 984 officers which is roughly 2.4 officers per 1,000 residents. The FBI and the FDLE have established that as the average ratio for sworn officers. 
Um, but that is not the only measurement that we use. There's the other considerations that we have in here is not just the ratio, technology, the real population, the population of the business boom, the special events, our calls for service. We talked before about our calls. They are slightly increasing, but not just the number of calls, but the time we spend on calls is increased. And then, of course, new assignments that our officers have that they haven't had in the past. So all that goes into our consideration for our staffing request. So this is the first half of this year versus the first half of last year in dispatch calls. You can see the dispatch calls are slightly increasing and the self-initiated calls are relatively the same and with our response times that are well within our, our goals. So fleet, we've talked about our vehicles in the past. The big thing that stands out here is we have nearly 200 cars, 190 to be exact, that are 2010 and older. So our goal is to get our fleet to a seven to nine year rotation, which is more of the industry standard. And uh, that was part of our budget request for additional money to help us facilitate that. We've talked about our crime rate and uh, Councilman Carlson actually did a good job presenting that as well. And uh, our violent crime is, is on the down. And uh, year to date, our numbers are down and this highlights last year's violent crime compared to cities our size in the nation. So what our strategic plan outlines, it outlines these core areas. It's crime reduction, community engagement, staffing and recruitment, capital improvement projects, and technological improvements. So highlighting these areas here, the first one we have is crime reduction. So how do we sustain this crime reduction? And how do we even improve on it? So it's, it's a challenge we've been making over the last year, you'll hear the mayor and, and the chief of staff talk about it is we've accomplished almost an 80% reduction in crime over the last several decades. And at some point, where is that bottom of that crime? We don't know. In a perfect world, we'd like to eliminate all crime and prevent it from happening. But the more crime we reduce, the harder and harder it is to continue to reduce it and also maintain that reduction. So coming up with innovative ideas, what we want to do and what we continue to do is focused on evidence-based. If you're only going to give me three minutes, I got to. No, 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 no that have worked across the nation and strategies that we create that are proven that uh, we've seen this morning that other agencies take from us. So we want to focus on those. Some of those are firearms, um, grants, uh, focused deterrence, our crime gun intelligence center. Those are areas that actually have been huge successes for us that are actually modeled across the nation is continue that and expand those. Uh, moving on to the next slide, it focuses on property crime. Obviously with property crime, we've talked about auto burglaries and uh, education, and including increased public outreach of locking your car and taking your valuables, especially your firearms out of your car. One of the things we're also trying to do is get more of our community members to assist us in that, which is increasing our communication with um, neighborhood watch groups and ensure that crimes are being investigated thoroughly. So interesting point right here is I was speaking with the Cleveland police chief last night and they are experiencing a huge surge in auto thefts. Hmm. And they were talking about the Kias and Hyundais, which we have experienced, but nowhere near the level of their surge. So we were talking about the strategies that we do and how we thoroughly investigate those. And he's like, I don't have the resources to do what you all are doing. Like, you know, we do probation checks, we do um, offender checks, He's down like 300 officers, and he doesn't have that ability to do that, and he's making up for ground, and I don't know if he'll ever be able to catch up. I actually felt bad for him having that conversation. We don't ever want to be in a position like that. Uh, so moving on is um, community outreach. How do we expand those? How do we expand our youth programs, build in our next generation, maintain trust and confidence? And uh, we talked about the Police Athletic League already. I don't want to be too repetitive on that, but we have um, our Rich House programs. If you're not familiar with that, we have one in Sulphur Springs and Robles Park. Eventually, we would like to expand that into West Tampa. 
It's more of a vision for us now, but over the next five years, we'd like to have a plan outlined for that. You saw this morning the success of the Shielding Our Teens program. Obviously, we want to capitalize on that again. Uh, expand that, expand our Police Explorers program. Currently, that program actually only goes for high school. We want to expand that into middle school. And uh, <coughs> communications and mentorship. So um, other programs to develop. You know, who knows what the next Officer Baker is going to come up with ideas that we haven't even thought of before. So in addition to that, um, increase our community outreach. So we have here um, neighborhood watch programs, expand the neighborhood watch program. So one thing that we've started to do uh, in our ComStat meetings, we have monthly crime meetings and talk about where crimes are surging and, and what's happening in there and what's causing it, is now measuring those areas of high pockets of crime and whether or not a neighborhood watch program is there or not. And it's interesting when you overlay the crime and you can see some pockets of fence crime, there's a neighborhood watch program that's missing from that neighborhood. So we've challenged our commanders to solicit and engage more of the community in those neighborhood watches and measuring that. So that, that's a goal of ours is to increase the neighborhood watch programs. Uh, front porch roll calls, um, obviously that's a success of ours. You may have not seen it that we advertise is having a front porch roll call in your neighborhood, in your house, and you can go online and, and actually request that. And then community-oriented policing. Uh, that's a philosophy that I talked about this morning that we've instituted in the department, not just a certain squad, but officer-wise, is to continue that training. And one of the things we did and that we're continuing to expand is the new recruits that come in, before we give them a badge, a gun, and a uniform, we bring them out into the community. We bring them out to violent crime forums. We bring them out into fundraisers. So they get to hear the community and see the community's events before putting on the uniform. In addition to that, the new recruits, when they finish their field training program, we require them to complete a community-oriented policing project to come up with a solution. And then the one that's uh, best picked by that captain, actually we bring to the staff. We have a new recruit who comes to the staff and shares with us their initiative and idea. So we're trying to become increased problem solvers in addressing the core issue of crime. So um, the next part on here is develop a strategic communications plan. That's something that we're actively working on. It'll take some time to do. But this is an involved plan where how the department communicates both internally and externally. Uh, that stakeholder group could be neighborhood watch groups. It could be city council. It could be um, community activists. It could be citizens. It could be um, nonprofits and to collaborate with community members on the best way that they like that communication. At our last uh, Tuesday town hall meeting, we asked the community how they engage with us. We asked them if it was Twitter, uh, Instagram, they went on our website, and you'd be surprised how many of them don't even realize how many of avenues there are. So communicating that and engaging with the community more. Uh, so homeless. It's an issue that uh, we've seen, and how can we address that? We want to look at expanding our homeless liaison program and increasing our collaboration with outside stakeholders and, again, addressing problem-oriented policing. Uh, I was just looking at an article today uh, from Syracuse addressing this very topic, and it's something that's near and dear to our heart is providing more resources. You'd be surprised how many homeless do not know what resources that are out there. So um, expanding that program and reorganizing it is in the distant horizon for us. So um, expanding and address community members suffering mental health crisis kind of goes hand in hand. And uh, we have our behavioral health unit. We've talked about it. We're reorganizing that to work more hand in hand with our homeless liaisons. And we're looking for additional grant funding to expand that unit. While it's not in this year's budget, it will be in the next several years uh, to increase that and to actually look at other jurisdictions and see what's working well for them and what's not. Uh, St. Pete's program, the call program keeps coming up. That is something that we're looking at, um, what works well for them. Our program, if you recall, was developed by the mental health stakeholders in Hillsborough County, unique to this area. But we do like to take what works well in other communities and evaluate them and see if it's worth addressing over here. This covers the last point there. And then additional tools to help us with the mental health crisis. 
So we do provide our officers de-escalation training. We were actually one of the forefront agencies before it was a thing. We were doing that in our training. And um, to continue training all of our officers in crisis response intervention. It is a cost for us to do that. It takes uh, another week before officers hit the street just to receive that training, but we do think that it's worthwhile. And we are moving forward with um, integrating our specialists in the 911 center with crisis intervention training and working on a grant by providing specialists there that can actually be on the forefront of the call even before someone arrives to the scene. So um, this is a lot of repetitive from our budget request, but we want to maintain an efficient and effective workforce. And we proposed in our budget adding 30 sworn officers. Uh, we proposed uh, raising the number of sponsored police academies from one to two. And we continually evaluate the needs for professional staff. So every year we do meet uh, yearly and go over our staffing plan, our business plan, and we make adjustments based on that year. And if we do see a need for a budget increase request, then we submit that to the mayor's office. Um, in concert with the population growth, uh, we look at positions and whether or not it goes up or if it goes down, uh, we go both ways on, on adjusting our personnel strength. Uh, grant opportunities are something that we capitalize on. It's a grant that we applied for for those 30 officers. And um, expanding on grant opportunities now is the time to do. We don't, we're not sure how much longer some of these grants will be available with the federal program. And then the last one is our reserve officer program. If you're not aware, we have roughly 120 reserve officers that donate their time to the city. They alleviate a lot of us from working some special events. I actually started here as a reserve officer, so I'm very familiar with the program, and we want to continue that and expand it. So employee wellness, expand the wellness programs to all employees, not just the sworn officers, but our professional staff, our forensic units, our records units, our dispatchers, and incorporate additional training into that program. Uh, one thing that we're just getting ready to start is uh, a wellness mobile app, um, which actually was provided by a grant from the federal government to allow our employees to reach out for peer um, debriefings and other resources that they may not readily have available to them. And you, every time you come up here and you see an officer of the month, they're typically here with a family member. That family member feels that stress too. Reaching out to them and supporting the family is a goal of ours, increasing that. We do have many family uh, programs out there now for spouses and there's many free resources out there which wouldn't even impact our budget it's just making those connections so we do have people there but we want to continue that and expand it and we talked about the peer support so then safety ourselves uh, ballistic shields our officers have our officers have ballistic vest believe it or not I don't know if it's a gimmick or not but they say they have a shelf life of five years so we have to replace those every five years we have above and beyond what our budget requires, we have our police foundation, Rise Tampa, that provides ballistic shields. Uh, they continue to do that. And any other resources out there, um, carbine rifles, you know, you've seen, I think there was the last shooting that we had that the suspect had stabbed, um, hit the mother of his child like 13 times in front of them that had a rifle that was threatening. Our officers have to be prepared to address the threats that are face faced with them. So um, we need to provide them with both the offensive and the defensive measures to keep themselves and the community safe. And then obviously a trauma, whether it's a trauma with a citizen or whether it's trauma with an officer, is to be able to give them those life-saving measures immediately on scene. So recruiting and retaining highly qualified officers. So it's, it's something that is a challenge nationwide. And I just talked about the Cleveland Police Chief, down nearly 300 officers. Fortunately, we're not experiencing here to the level of the other nations, but we don't want to get behind the curve. So we are annually reviewing a recruitment plan, setting up, um, reviewing our holdover training, our field training program, and seeing what adjustments we need to make. So for example, we were just talking this morning in our meeting about the recruitment we're doing at the historic black colleges at HCC, at UT, at USF. Um, if you recall, we have a 30 by 30 initiative, and one of the areas we're seeing success is looking at UT and USF female sports and getting some recruitment there. You said female sports? Yes. 
Uh, so the, I, I think I already touched on a, a lot of this here is the 30 by 30, just got ahead of myself. All right, so looking at this in a conservative estimate of the city growth, we've outlined the next five years of what we believe on a conservative level the population would be, and then to maintain the, the 2.4 ratio. So at 2024, if we were to receive that grant, um, we would add 30 officers, which would put us at a 2.45. And then you can see basically down the line, there's an asterisk there because that number could go up or could go down. If the population goes down, obviously, or stays the same, we wouldn't be requesting officers that would be evaluated on a year by year basis. But potentially, if it goes along that scale, we could add if the budget would allow up to 80 sworn positions by 2028. And capital improvement projects, I'm gonna let uh, Deputy Chief Johnson highlight on those because he's been doing a lot of the research there. Calvin Johnson, Deputy Chief Tampa Police Department. So on the first one, our goal is trying to complete the impound lot and forensics unit with the move to Howard Avenue. Um, I would like to say that our folks, they work very hard on the impound lot and we were able to move from 34th Street already to Lois Avenue where Crockett Twing was at. It took a lot of work. Um, they did a great job doing that. The Howard Avenue project, um, we're consistently working on that with um, Lamb, and trying to get the best product out there, making sure the facility covers evidence and forensics. Um, when it comes down to the uh, renovation of the training facility, we work hand in hand with police fire. Um, we train sometimes at the same place. And we're trying to make sure that the upgrades and renovations, they work both for police and fire. So we meet all the time trying to get that plan in focus, and hopefully when it's done, it's going to benefit both police and fire. When it comes down to the um, future relocation of police headquarters, that's in discussion. Um, no real plans at this time, trying to find the location, trying to find out what we need, trying to find out um, how big of a spot that takes a whole lot. So. That's a work in progress, and we can get back with you on that in the near future. But when it comes down to the forensic at the impound lot, um, a lot went into not just our evidence going out there, but actually how we process DNA, how we process blood, how we process fingerprints. Um, that is also an aspect of going to the new impound lot. Um, the layout of that, um, working with that supervisor from forensics and evidence, they work hand in hand to make sure that what we're doing out there, the new location is gonna really fit everybody as a team and partner when it comes down to um, how we handle crime before it goes to court and after it goes to court to make sure those that hurt our community are held accountable. When it comes to the infrastructure that we have, that's District 1, District 2, District 3, communications and headquarters. Um, they're in pretty good condition right now. Whenever things go on regarding a fence being broke or regarding a leak or something like that, Lamb responds when we request them and they make sure things are taken care of in a speedy manner. So um, all three districts at, the, at this point in time are in pretty good condition and no complaints regarding our communications building. But when it comes down to um, additional police vehicles, Chief Burkhall touched on that regarding our goal and what we're trying to get to with the police vehicles. Something else that we have on this slide right here is we're trying to make sure that our air service, I know Major Mills came here a few weeks ago and talked about air service. We're trying to make sure that the fleet that we have, it stays up to date. Some of the helicopters, they have uh, put in a whole lot of time, and we got to make sure that our pilots are up there and they're safe when they're flying the helicopters. We already hit this slide Chief Burkhardt did previously regarding our vehicles. Going into technology, um, our main thing with technology, the crime fight has changed. Um, how folks 
look into committing crimes has changed. And we have to change at times and plus be ahead of the curve when it comes back to um, combating crime. So what we're trying to do is expand technology employed by the Real-Time Crime Center to help us out really in big projects, parades, and if violent crimes occur in certain areas, they can have that overall view and direct the officers on where to go in real time. What we're trying to do with the Crime Gun Intelligence Center, the NIBIN and stuff, when folks shoot the firearm, sometimes they leave the rounds there. What we're able to do is get those rounds, get good evidence off of those to help us hold them accountable. We're always trying to get better in that because the main focus of us at TPD is to bring down violent crime. When it comes down to technology regarding cyber crimes, internet crimes against children, we're always trying to make sure that we're ahead of the curve with that. Um, our children, our, our youth being preyed upon by predators is not acceptable. Um, we try and get the best resources that we have or that's available in society and, and get it through grants or whenever we can and use that to hold folks accountable when it comes down to crimes against children. When it comes down to how we deploy it in the community, it's very important when it comes down to community outreach. And I know the chief brought up the cell phone in a couple of conversations. Um, they do a lot for the officers as far as investigating crimes, but also the community, I give out my phone number daily and folks call me daily. They, they want to hear from the police. Um, we had a meeting up there in Sulphur Springs a couple of two days ago and one thing they said there as a community is they want to be able to talk to the officers. Um, they saw our staff up there and they're like, no, we need your officers here. So getting the officers a way to communicate without giving their personal numbers out to the citizens because they need their privacy, this will help them bridge that gap with the community. When it comes down to community surveys, that's how we get the concerns of our citizens and we get their sentiments. So we're always trying to get the best kind of surveys that we can and we partnership with the Citizen Review Board to make sure we're on the right page with the surveys. And we're gonna try and put those out there to find out how we're policing. It's very important to us to police in a way that uplifts the health of the city of Tampa. Transparency is very important when it comes down to law enforcement. Um, there's been a lot of discussions here in city council, but also nationwide with law enforcement and transparency. We're trying to get the best technology to improve our website, to put things out there so folks have easy access to it. Um, we take recommendations on how we can improve it, and we're always trying to find the best um, way to let the citizens know that we value the information that they're asking for and being able to get that information to them. Um, the the body-worn camera, I got to say, when it first came out years ago, there was a lot of hesitant in law enforcement. It's changed because at times it helps us out. It shows a different story. It shows what's really happening on certain calls out there. Um, it allows our staff and our officers to get coached and we can oversee what they're doing because there's two sides of policing when you're in the administration, making sure crime is getting reduced, but also in a safe manner and everybody gets treated with dignity and respect. So when they first came out, there was a lot of hesitation, really nationwide. Um, we embraced it. We still embrace it. It helps out our officers on a daily basis, and we're going to continue trying to make that very effective in the near future. So in conclusion, this is it's a vision that outlines specific goals for us. And under each goal, then we've added strategies to complete those goals. And we put those goals under these categories here, under crime reduction, community engagement, mm -hmm. staffing and recruitment, capital improvement projects, and technological improvements. So this is, this is almost like it's a guide for us over the next five years to stay on our goals and determine, OK, what strategies do we need to do to achieve those goals? And if there's a budget increase request that year, then we would bring that. But this is a way for us to hold ourselves accountable and to measure what we plan on doing or what we plan on needing over the next five years. Thank you very much, Chief, for a very detailed presentation. I know this took a lot of hard work, you and your team putting this together. You two, uh, uh, Deputy Chief Johnson, um, 
So for the 30 new officers that are in the, uh, talking about this, this budget, there was grant money, but you needed funding to match that, correct? Yes. Let me go back to that slide, see if I can find it. So the 30, we applied for a grant, and okay. the grant is a five-year grant. Okay. Years one through three are a match. Years four and five, the city is on the hook for 100%. So um, if we are approved that grant in October 1st, which we should find out, then we would need the match for the first year, which is what we submitted in our budget request. And that was, was it eight, nine hundred thousand dollars or was it more? Um, I believe the first year was roughly 1.8, but I'd have to get the exact number from Okay, no, no, that's, that's what I had. So you would need $1.8 million in this budget in order to uh, match the, the grant for the, for the first year. So Roughly thereabouts, yes. It would be, let's say it's 1.8, but 1.8 for the first three years, and then the city would be on the hook in year four that's, and five? That's year one. Okay, year one. All right. And then with the uh, vehicles, vehicles have been purchased with CIT money in the past, correct? correct? Okay. The CIT comes up for expiration around the corner, but it would go on a ballot most likely next year in anticipation of it expiring if it goes on the ballot for renewal. Once the, if it does get renewed, we can look beyond the, what we, you know, it'll, it'll be sunsetting in 26, 27, or whatever it is, 27. We can look beyond that and start uh, committing CIT money, whatever percentage we get, that we can look at future purchases down the road for vehicle replacements, I would assume. Now that we know there is a, a, an extended lifeline, per se. So... Um, going in specifics about the funding, I can tell you that the budget request we put in was above and beyond the CIT fundings to get our vehicle there. So just the CIT fundings alone yeah, but was it would not enough us. to bring our fleet up to where we needed. Yeah. So the specific Sorry. allocation Sorry. I'd have to defer to our CFO on. Okay. I'm thinking in the future, after funds that we've committed through the existing CIT, should the CIT be renewed, we can... I guess it depends it. on how that pie sliced yeah, and where yeah, all the we'll needs know, are. You know, after the fact, if it all happens, what we get. So um, I believe that is that is it. I saw a lot of hands go up. Councilman Carlson, I'll start with you. Vieira, Clendenin. Mm -hmm. Okay. Go, sir. Thank you, sir. Um, I, echoing what my colleague just said, this is a very detailed presentation. Appreciate the time and effort. Um, Obviously, it shows your academic background and seriousness you take to it, and we appreciate the transparency also. Um, you talked about, I'm just going to ask some random questions. You talked about communication plan, just because my industry, like who's doing it, how are you guys doing in-house, or are you outsourcing? Um, a little bit of both. It's a very complex project, and I just hired a new uh, public information officer. So it's a collaborative effort on that, and uh, it's going to be specific to... Uh, modeled off of the DOD Department of Justice and the COPS office and the major city chiefs actually recently published a template on a uh, police agency strategic communications plan. So we're using that as a template. To so you think you'll be able to do it all in-house? No, I'm going to need some assistance out of house. Um, and, then, and then going back two or three years, uh, we heard a lot of negative feedback in the community about communication from the police department, which I talked about a lot in public um, and uh, I won't go back through all the examples but I, I have not heard any complaints in the last since, since you've been on for sure so whatever has changed thank you to whomever has done that everybody's um, drinking the Kool-Aid now what did you say <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just I'm saying everybody's we're, drinking we're the Kool-Aid but I you may you may I, not be aware of it but today you actually approved um, a technological advancement yeah. for yeah. us that's going to engage with the community and once we roll that out get it tested and make sure that's working right, then we'll release it publicly, but it's gonna connect the community to the police department like it's never happened before. And I think, uh, you know, sometimes people get criticized for putting an individual out, but you're also new in that role. And um, uh, you know, everywhere I track online, uh, from the emails we get that the PIO is sending out to the media, very thorough, detailed, to the, um, the, the tweets and, and um, other posts, 
I think all of it is very good at, at trying to communicate with the public. So hats off and to that, you. And that was short. We, we didn't have a head PIO. We actually just hired Janae Lewis <coughs> from Fox 13. So um, she just came on starting Tuesday. So all that was with one person short. So we're expecting to expand on that. Yeah, so con anyway, congrats to everybody. Um, you, I, I have to bring this up, uh, you know, a few months ago, uh, sorry, late last year, the PBA told me that we needed 200 police officers. I talked about that a lot in the campaign. Um, the mayor said we didn't need any, um, and now we need 30. So can you just tell me what happened, um, what, what changed? I, the mayor never told me that we didn't need any. Uh, we presented a case in our budget increase request, and we presented a, a method that would save the taxpayers quite a bit of money with this grant. So that's what we proposed in the mayor and on the money, you were t what were you telling me the other day? Um, Chief Bennett has said it's about $100,000 per police officer, but you said all in it's like 150 or something like that? If you count buying police cars and everything there, it's about 170000 And so um, hiring 30 officers, I, I did some quick math, several million dollars like in the five or Well, t in basic math, 10 officers would be 1.7. Yeah, so that means the grant is going to be like three or four million. The, the first year, the first year. It's, it's about two thirds. And then... Um, you spent a lot of time with me, as I thanked you last week on the violent crime rate. Um, the, and because you're a data person, I'll ask this question, but it peaked, sorry I don't have this chart out, but it peaked around 2015 at um, almost 2,300. And this is the way the FBI counts mm -hmm. violent crime, which is different, right. I think, than the way the chiefs do it, uh, the National Chief Association. But it went 20, 2,300, and then it went down for several years. The bottom was like 2018, about 1,600. But then uh, 2020, it popped back up a lot to 2119. And then uh, 2021, it was 2229. 20, and then last year, it was 2186. So from 2021 to 2022, I, I calculate 2% drop, which is in the right direction. But we're still way ahead of where we were in 2018. And I say this knowing that you're just relatively new in the police chief. But what um, what do you think caused that spike? And, and you talked a lot about what you're doing to correct it, but is there anything else you'd like to say on why it happened before and how you, what well, you're well, going to do Well, the spike isn't unique to the city of Tampa. It's a nationwide spike. And we've seen that more. It's access to firearms. Um, it's the pandemic in general. It's, it, there's a whole slew of factors there. And I think it was mentioned, it's the core issue, right? What, what are some things we can do? reduce access to firearms, communicate that out. That was something we outlaid in the plan, is how to educate citizens not to leave firearms unsecured in your vehicle or in your house. Some of the measures that we've taken is putting that out, providing free gun locks. So, so in the crime triangle, basically, you're, you're trying to not only make it more difficult for the suspect to commit a crime, but you're also asking the victim to be held accountable to make the access less easier. So education on that is key. Uh, I think the trends that are going nationwide, we're not experienced to the level we are here. And I think part of that is Tampa's innovation in the crime gun intelligence unit, having that intelligence, having the ability to look at evidence as far as shell casings right away and determining if there's a linkage between a shooting and another shooting uh, helps our detectives out tremendously, and we have that ability to get that turnaround within days versus weeks or months, like some other agencies have that ability. And I would just say, if, you, if you'd ever like to come back and talk about this more and educate us in the public, I, I mean, we can talk one on one, but it's great for or, the public to hear. Or you can sign up for class at USF and get college credit for it. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> yeah, send it to me. I'd like to do that. So, um, uh, the last thing is you talked about mental health. Thank you for focusing on that. There are some members of the community who pushed to have a separate mental health unit. Um, I got a lot of pushback from uh, police, but also from the mental health industry, saying they, they, it needs to be a partnership. You all worked with the administration to create a, 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 a hybrid. Um, there are still some members of the community that want it to be completely separate. Um, we can debate that another time, but um, I appreciate the update on this. and. Anything you all can do to give us regular updates on the on the kinds of cases you're dealing with and the benefit of that. I think you all see a definite benefit. I know there was a, a high profile case in downtown a few weeks ago with someone from South Florida, and um, and and anything you can do to talk about uh, how that's working and and 
and how it's been beneficial would be helpful to us to be able to explain to the community that even with this hybrid situation, it is helping to prevent uh, problems in the community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Vieira, Clendenin, Miranda. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Appreciate it, sir. Um, I, I appreciate your, your presentation is always very, as other folks have said, very in-depth, et cetera. Um, so, you know, crime is obviously, public safety is always the biggest issue. That's why we've been pushing for a public safety master plan for a long time. I don't have to lecture yourself or the firefighters or Chief Tripp and others about that, obviously. Uh, that, that's what y'all do for a living 24-7. And we just want to make sure that we put that on the forefront for the city of Tampa every single day, every single week, uh, to make sure that we do planning uh, with regards to revenue, et cetera, et cetera. So if I'm hearing you right, and correct me if I'm wrong, please correct me if I'm wrong, um, it'll take about $1.8 million for year one for the matching grant for the 30 officers, correct? Yeah, yeah give or take the exact number I'd have to, it's right rough, there, yeah. rough estimate. And that money, because I want to make sure for this discussion on Tuesday, um, that money was supposed to come from, the, that was budgeted from the millage increase. Wednesday. Wednesday. Uh, yeah, yeah, Wednesday, I'm sorry. Again, um, I'll defer to Dennis on that. Okay, okay. Um, well, and, and I'll, I'll ask him because, again, if it was budgeted from the millage increase, um, then we in, need to in know. In generalities, when you're applying for a grant, you can't budget for officers. So it's just having ability to have the access to the matching funds, which uh -huh. we can talk about. That's what's in reserves. Oh, I'm sorry, what? That's how they parked in the reserves. Yes. Okay, okay. So, yeah, that, so that's something that I want to know because when we're looking at, at, at budget cuts, et cetera, in other words, we want to make sure that we have that money available. Um, with the steps that we took on Tuesday, and, and I guess we'll defer to Mr. Rahara on that, on whether or not the, the money would be available. I know that 0.21 of the 1.0 budget or the 1.0 millage, 21% was dedicated to public safety. That's about eight or nine, ten million dollars. So that's something that I obviously want to find out, so that we know what we have to do, et cetera. We have to find that money somewhere, et cetera, um, and and with the vehicles, et cetera. So that's that's my only question is I just want to make sure that we don't waive that grant. So so today you can't you can't tell us whether or not that money um, is is available in the budget. We have to de defer to Mr. Rahera. It's my understanding that they have the. Um the money for the match if we were awarded the grant. But where good. that money is, you'd have to ask him. Okay, great. No, good. Thank God. Because I didn't, I didn't want to have to find $2 million. $2 million. Well, um, again, uh, now that the millage didn't pass, that changes the dynamics of that's it. That's what I'm asking. And, and yes, sir. That would be a Dennis question. Okay. So yes. I'll, I'll have to inquire with him on that. That's yes. very important. And again, I, I hope the answer is that, that, that we have it without the millage. But that's something that we, we have to find out, obviously, because that's something that all of us here uh, support 100% and that we want to build a bridge for. Um, so that's all. So I, I can inquire with Mr. O'Hara, and I'm sure we all will. Um, but again, very uh, detailed presentation. And um, yeah, a very important issue. We, we appreciate both of you all. Thank you. Clendenin, Miranda, Henderson. Uh, my name's not Dennis, and I'm not that skinny, but I'll answer that. We, the money's not there without it. We're going to have to cut it from somewhere else. That, it, the, the money, the money that had been parked in the reserves, that was that part of that fund. And this, and this is just the tip of the iceberg. So and, buckle up. And I, okay, <laughs> buckle thank up. Thank you. That's what I was asking. Buckle and up. That's what I thought. I didn't, um, I didn't want to lead you. So um, a couple of observations. Um, based on what I just saw, as far as needs of the, of the police force, you're looking at a seven-year replacement program for vehicles, right? And if that, ideally, if that's yes. the case, 46% of your vehicles are in that time parameter already. And that's with existing CIT funds. So we're already at a 46% of the vehicles with existing funding sources are seven years or older in the police force. I just want to highlight that, reference our previous discussions about this budget. Um, so the CIT is already factored into, these, into, the, into this equation. Now, if we lose the CIT, yeah, God knows where we're going to go. If, if that's if the CIT passes with the percentages and with if, 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 if. Um, iPhones. The iPhones, did you uh, have the discussion on impact and implementation with the PVA, the union? Is the union okay with the iPhones? Yes, the concern was the same current concern that Councilman Hurtak brought up the other night at, I don't know, it was some crazy hour. Um, yes. Yeah, um, I know, I remember. <laughs> yeah, if we, if we were to get the funding for the phones, we would sit down with the PBA and develop a policy and, and how that would be implemented and all be in agreement on that 
and clearly not um, tracking anybody on their day off. So you'll have I and I on uh, for for the, for the implementation right. of that. So I just want to make sure. And again, the I think you highlighted at that meeting the benefit crime photo photos, which will help in our prosecution rates. <clears throat> we having accurate, timely photographs, being able to communicate for community based policing. Correct. And I'm sure the list goes on. And e on even and the on. records management system is right. Which, by the way. I have two iPhones. Okay. This is mine. This is the city's. So, yeah, what's well, good for me? You know, it's like so. There, there you go. Um, now, the one concern I have is your FTEs, the number of police that you have, and, the, and what you're using. So, right now, if I heard you correctly, our ratio is right at the FBI or the federal standard, correct? Correct. Now, how when that is factored in? Do they, because you know, not that we're unique, but we're in a different classification of mo other types of communities because we're a tourist destination. We're also the workforce destination of a lot of, uh, of people who come into our city every day and work here and leave. They're not necessarily residents, and we have a large student population. So, between students and tourists and workers, how does that factor in to the need of uh, law enforcement in that ratio? It does. It factors in. There's um, some cities that could operate somewhat efficiently at a 1.9 percent. Okay, so that per, that that percentage. That's an average. The 2.4 is an average. Uh, it's it's an average that we're trying to stay above and not go below, because of those factors that you've added in there. Right. There's other things that augment us in that as well. USF has their own police department. Right. UT has their own security. So there's some things that help us out. In Except that for those mix. students love to wander into Ybor City at nighttime, yes, and, the, and USF police yeah. are not there. They're not yeah. there. You're correct. Yeah. So, um, so that, but we're right at that average right now, right? We are. I mean, so we don't have any room to wiggle without correct. dropping below that standard. Correct. Okay. okay. Very good. Thank you. Councilman Miranda, then Councilman. Thank you, Chairman, Chief, and, and Deputy Chief. What what percent of ratio of crime is committed by individuals who not not doing the crime of themselves, but they leave the keys in the car, the door open, or the keys to the house, even the car may be closed, mm -hmm. but there's a separate set of keys in the car, they're gone on vacation or whatever. Do we have those statistics at all? So I don't have the exact, but it's roughly uh, anywhere from 70 to 80 percent of cars are left unlocked. So um, that's part of our strategic communications plan is how to educate the public more on that. And, and, and I know you're doing everything you can, but how do we drill this into the citizens that you're creating part of the biggest crime ratio is yourself, creating it by being just careless? Well, I think it's one thing to do it knowingly, and the other thing is just you're not aware and, yeah. and haven't been educated, and, and that's our goal is to, is to educate community. Well, maybe we can get some commercials or the gratitude for the public. The second one is auto thefts. I remember sometimes in the mid-'90s, we had over 11,000 cars stolen in the city of Tampa. We had it down to 400 something, I forget what it was a few years back. I don't know where it's at now. So maybe that's another we can work at. The, next, the, the third one to me is the most important. Crime is created way before you pull the crime yourself. It's who you hang around with, what age is parity when you're 8, 9, 12 years old, <laughs> hang around with somebody 15 and 16, and they're doing it, and you see that, and you say, oh, this is cool, and, and that kind of stuff. And, and I know you're working on that. Is, is any part of your statistics ever related to how the kid became who they are by watching someone do what you shouldn't do? I don't know if there's a statistic on that, but it, it's, um, you know, it's anecdotal that that is happening. And we do address that with initiatives that we have now that I don't think any officer would have imagined 30 years ago that we are filling a gap that we didn't fill before. And I know your, your, your floor is at uh, 240 or above. And, and how do we compare with other units, police agencies in this area and with the police agencies in the whole state of Florida compared to that 240 ratio? Um, well, again, I'd have to pull that up. But uh, the, the 1.9 was an agency in Arizona, I believe, as an example. So um, some you'd probably find higher and some you'd find lower. But I'd have to pull that up. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it if you can give mm -hmm. us something like that. Mm -hmm. But anyway, thanks for the job you've all of you are doing, your men and women of the police force, and let's see what happens in society. The more we talk about this country being divided in half, the more crime we're going to get. That's just my opinion. Thank you. Thank Councilwoman you. Henderson. Dr. Chief, Deputy Chief, thank you so much for your presentation. It was a pretty good PowerPoint. 
Um, I have a couple of questions regarding, one is pretty simple, who can I talk to or who is assigned to your detail um, plan when it comes to recruitment of officers? So Major Kim Fruit. Kim Fruit? Yes. Okay. And the other question that I have is um, in terms of overtime, that's not talked about, um, you know, in your budget. Officers do overtime, right? There is. There's um, overtime that is an expense to the city that's okay. budgeted. There's an overtime that's grant overtime. Okay. And then there's extra duty jobs that are reimbursed by a vendor. Okay. So is that factored into our upcoming budget proposal? Yes. All that was placed in the budget. Okay. So overtime, is it mandatory or is it required? Is it voluntary? How does that work? For the most part, it's not mandatory. There's a few, very few exceptions, but for the most part, it's optional. Okay. And special events and things like that are already factored into the amount of officers that we need. They, a lot of the special events that we work mm -hmm. are on their days off that they're coming in and working. Okay, I see. So for budget purposes, what would be the thing that you could give up as a chief of police for your department? Uh, I don't think that's a fair question to I know. ask. It's, I, I, it, we, I, we submitted our budget request through the mayor and it was approved by the mayor and, mm -hmm. and those were our requests. I think maybe we could address those topics on Wednesday. Yeah. I, I think that's something that we need to sit down and analyze. I agree with you. Leading to our budget request, we had probably, I don't know, 20 different requests that we filtered down ourselves before we even brought them to the mayor mm -hmm. to approve. So that, it's a tough question. We would have to sit down and, and analyze that. No, you gave the answer I was looking for. There's nothing that you're willing to cut. Thank you. Thank you very much, Appreciate Councilwoman Hurtak. Thank you. Um, uh, I know I have a meeting scheduled with all the department heads on Friday to talk that very thing because we are going to have to cut. That's the unfortunate reality, and it would be helpful to know what priorities are that we can look from. Um, and so I wanted to ask, because if you need 1.8 million for the 30 officers, from my understanding, this grant was like, we're paying 25% the first year, 50% and then 100%. Is that how that, or 75? I'm not sure exactly how it goes, but over the three years, it's roughly $9 million expense. And then I believe roughly three and a half million of that would be the grant paid for in the city would be that but I'd have to get the exact numbers from our CFO. But it's roughly about a third to a half. And then year four and five, and then on and forever after that, then it's 100% on the city. So it's not just year one, it's year two, three, four, and especially five, where the costs start to okay. amplify. So I just did quick back of the envelope math, and that looks like $300,000 per officer? One, 170. The initial cost is roughly 170,000. I thought you said it was 1.8 million. No, that's oh. what we would need for the first Ten. year in regards to the hiring of the 30 officers with the grant and everything. Yes, which yeah. is $60,000 per officer. But there's uh, not including vehicle and other expenses uh, with that. Is that correct? Yeah, I'm not sure what math you're using, but the first year. I need 9 million divided by 30. So the first year of the grant is where the, um, the contribution from the federal government is the highest. Okay. But at what proportion, I'd have to research for you. Yeah, yeah, I'd like to know the proportion. Um, and then the other thing that, that you brought up here, um, the vehicle chart, when I added them up and I did it multiple times, I got 1,362 vehicles and we have 984 officers. So that's we, over three. That's 378 extra vehicles. Right. So we have vehicles for non-sworn staff. We also have fleet vehicles. You have to have for vehicles breakdown. We have training vehicles. So there's vehicles that are actively used that aren't assigned to officers. Okay. Because um, the public just needs to know that. Um, but the thing I would really love, because this was 
fabulously detailed and I, I, I would really love this from every department for their one to five year, what they really, really would love to focus on and I like how you organized it. Um, what I would really love uh, is for me, I'm more of a calendar person, so I would love to have seen a timeline of this is what we would like to focus on this year. This is what we would like to focus on next year. Because when you just give us all of these, especially in this year where we're going to have to make quite a few cuts, mm -hmm. it, would be ha it would be great to know what year you wish to focus on each thing, when, like, uh, you know, you'd like to get this online mm -hmm. in 2024, but, you know, this is for 2025. And so that's, for me, um, is more difficult. So I was, I'm, I'm hoping that we could get that. No, I know exactly what you're saying. I don't mean to interrupt, but that could change. So that's why we yearly have our yearly strategic meetings. Oh, yeah. And then anything that we would prioritize that year in this five-year plan that isn't already budgeted, then we would send that request for a budgeting increase request that year. So what we did this year is we analyzed what was most important to us and did that this year. So things that weren't in here that, you know, we're projecting, whether it's, you know, our behavioral health or our mental um, health plan, that would be something that if we couldn't budget ourselves and we would expand on, then that would be year two, three, or four. So Every year we would reprioritize it. So to say now that we want to do this year three may not be fair because a year from now, it might be year two that's more appropriate or year five that's more appropriate. So every year we readjust and reprioritize what's in our vision. Oh, absolutely. And I would expect that to change every year, but it would be helpful to have your five-year plan. Because I'm sort of like we do with a capital improvement project where we put our goals there, but then the next year when we have five years, those goals change and the mm -hmm. money moves around. And so for me, again, as we're looking at areas we are definitely going to be cutting, I would love to see that, to see where your priorities lie, to see, to help figure out where, um, you know, things that we'll be able to move to, the, uh, to future budgets. Um, mm -hmm. Because that's, that is simply the reality of the situation that we are in. So um, I would greatly appreciate that. But thank you again for this detailed presentation. And I look forward to it for the next several years. I think it's a really phenomenal detailed document. Okay. Again, thank you very much, Chief. I know we won't have this discussion until until Wednesday, but cutting from public safety, it's a very big budget. It's going to be a very lengthy discussion, but that's that's not even on my list. So we'll discuss that Wednesday. We have a big budget to look at. So Councilman Vieira. Uh, yeah, just really quick, because I, I, Councilman Clendenin answered my question, which I would have gone, uh, which would have made some remarks on. And I do want to say, so uh, essentially, that millage, right, would have paid for the spending you're talking about. Now we didn't pass any of the millage increase. So what we're looking, when we say we have to cut, we're cutting to keep the increased spending that was proposed, or a lot of it that was proposed in the mayor's budget without the additional revenue. Um, and, and again, I, like I said um, Tuesday, I want to be a part of that, helping out, because I, I, we, we got to find solutions. But I'm just saying is that's a really big deal when you want to keep housing, keep police, keep fire, and that's going to be increased spending. Um, you know, my, my thought with having a very small, tiny millage increase of, of 0.3 was so that we could take care of that. So we could take the increase of public safety off the table and then we could talk about budget cuts for those human, what you call the social welfare needs, the housing, things like that, et cetera. Because uh, now we find ourselves in a situation where we're going to have to look for budget cuts um, for police, for the increased spending in fire. And mind you, as we'll talk about with fire, the budget didn't even include a fire station. So there's a whole lot of things we're going to have to look for, a lot of competing interests. And it, it's and again, I, I, I want to be a part of, of helping that go forward because these are things that all seven of us support, 110%. Nobody here is against the police. Nobody here is against fire, anything of that nature. Um, I, I, I just thought that by taking that somewhat, whatever you restrained approach, um, as opposed to prohibitive on the millage, that we could m make sure that public safety was taken care of uh, and whatnot. And, and I have gotten, you know, like everybody, it is what it is, some emails blasting me on it. And guess what? I, I, I stand by what I tried to do because uh, I, I thought it was the right thing to do and, and whatnot. But, um, but again, I'm part of the solution. We're all part of the solution. And, and God willing, we'll get it done because public safety is issue number one. It always is. Uh, thank you, guys.
All right, thank you very much, Chief. At this time, we'll bring up our fire chief, uh, who also has a presentation, which will be brought up uh, on the screen. Yes, ma'am. And if we could bring it up on the big screen, the presentation. Good morning, Council. I'm sorry, good afternoon, Council. Uh, Barbara Tripp here, Fire Chief for Temple Fire Rescue. Um, I just want to address item number 72 and basically states that Temple Fire Rescue provided an action plan to address the fire deficit as part of a uh, public safety master plan. Further, that said, plan include various potential revenue sources, uh, securities deficits, including funding for additional stations, manpower equipment, mental health support, utilizing uh, update and timely data points. So I hope in this presentation I'll be able to address this. Of course, it's dated as far as the 20 to 25 since I've been in this position. We've been working on kind of like a strategic plan for Temple Fire Rescue. Uh, a lot of the information has been addressed, you know, through previous um, um, city council meetings, and I apologize for anything repeat, but I know we have some new uh, city council members, so some of the stuff might be repetitious, but I apologize for that. So just to let you know that I had a couple of meetings with Local 754. We've come up with some um, talking points based between the both of us, and hopefully we'll come up with some um, ideas to give council. Let's begin. Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. So once again, we talk about our mission and vision. Of course, the men and women in Temple Fire Rescue strive to uphold the mission and vision, you know, every day and respond to calls for services. And of course, we definitely want to provide uh, those, uh, the community with the updated technology to be able to provide the service that uh, the community has called for. And basically, uh, these core values um, are the pillars of which Tampa Fire Rescue stands on to deliver that mission and vision um, to the community. So this is what we live by as far as our core values. And just to let you know, over the last two years, this is an administration that has been persevering through many challenges where some of the things we had to start from the bottom. You know, and we definitely overcame a lot of obstacles to direct, to direct Tampa Fire Rescue in the right directions. A lot of those obstacles include the health and wellness, you know, RET doing and after the pandemic, the accreditation, the Super Bowl uh, equipment, and of course we had some uh, concerns with the technology. And of course one of the biggest major issues or deficit that we found was the delay from manufacturers with uh, products being available. And just wanted to give you a chart of basically the span of control of Tampa Fire Rescue, and this is from the firefighters all the way up to the fire chief and civilian and sworn, as well as reporting directly to the mayor. This chart here just um, have an outlay of the different districts uh, that's been broken up and how do we respond to the calls and how it's broken up within the city of Tampa. So with that said, as the motion had requested to identify um, an, an action plan to address some of the fire deficits, you know, here are some of the uh, deficits, the key objectives that we're looking to kind of identify to help with clearing up some of the deficit. So basically these are the five key objectives along with strategies that basically I briefly will discuss to assist with overcoming the deficits and with potential and proposed revenue resources. The first one is to ensure the mental and physical health of firefighters and staff. So each of the firefighters is going to be given a second set of bunker gear, and this is to help decrease the exposure to the carcinogens as well as other hazards they're exposed to. With that being said, we have received um, assistance, a firefighter grant, the AFG grant, to 
uh, obtain some additional um, extractors in which we wash and decontaminate some of the exposed gear. We've also received an assistance to firefighter grant for additional firefighters, which is a safer grant, and we also received an um, assistance firefighter grant for power load stretchers, which that help prevent bike injuries. And right now, um, all of our front line um, units have these power loads in them that are dated from 2016 to present. So part of this um, health and phys fit phys physical health of the firefighters also deals with the regional CIS team. Um, what happens with this CIS team, which is a critical incident stress management team, which is a regional team, it helped de-escalate uh, traumatic incidents and exposures to firefighters while on duty. Tampa Fire Rescue is in the process of developing a peer support mental team that will, co that will be coordinated by the current TFR chaplain to assist with first responders on and off duties for challenges they may face. Tampa Fire Rescue also have a peer fitness team to assist with uh, first responders that need physical assistance. And we're going to continue to partner with the, uh, local entities like the Franciscan Center um, that's there to support firefighters or first responders mentally. We have also been working with internal departments, including the fleet department, to assess the vehicles that we currently have and as far as future designs to see about the clean cap concept. So TFR has also identified a few training and educational deficit that will have an impact on revenue for Tampa Fire Rescue. Tampa Fire Rescue must remain in compliance with local and state and federal requirements being, state being a state approved training facility for multiple reasons. So first I just want to thank everyone, our state thank council for approving the recent uh, new burn training facility. And basically that burn facility, as well as the training grounds actually produce revenue as we continue to partner with the local schools, we also train individuals to become firefighters. Uh, we also source out classrooms as well as um, the facility itself to receive income for other entities that may want to do some training. In the last two years, TFR has increased its community engagement, and with that, we've actually had some positive initiative that has allowed Tampa Fire Rescue to receive close to $100,000 in donations for equipment. You know, we receive extrication equipment. That extrication equipment is used on a lot of the um, apparatuses out in the field to assist with extricating um, individuals from vehicles when needed that's trapped. We also receive donations for supplies, and we have just started our eighth um, CERT program, which is the Community Emergency Response Team, and we've also received grants and donation from that. So with this outreach, we've also received revenue, so we're going to continue with that. Um, once again, as we talk about technology, as we know our CAD system is um, actually almost 28 years old. We definitely don't have in the CAD, it's a computer aid dispatch system, my apologies. Um, we also have the automatic vehicle locator, which is um, not operating. So basically what we're looking to do is get some data-driven platform to assist with making some measurable decisions for the community by adding more resources. And also this data-driven technology will also assist us with the unit organization toward the men and women of Tampa Fire Rescue to decrease um, the amount of calls that they're running. So the process right now for obtaining this CAD is still ongoing. This dispatching system, and actually we're finalizing the evaluation phase and hoping to have this implemented within the next year. So as we talk about um, strategies for future growth, over the last two years, the administration have been meeting, having monthly meetings with multiple internal departments to discuss the future of TFR facilities as far as equipment. So basically we know these stations was built um, many years ago, and of course at the time they was built for a fire truck and not EMS services or emergency medical services was not of concern, which now that's primary of the primary goal of our calls and dispatches. So we've identified multiple challenges with equipment, meaning with the fire trucks and the rescue cars. We currently have 15 rescue cars that's on order, um, hoping to have the first set by the end of the year, if not the first of spring. Uh, that has been one of the problems that we've run into with the manufacturers with uh, supply chain demand um, not being available. 
within those internal departments, meaning we've worked with City of Tampa uh, facilities, City of Tampa um, maintenance department, TFR maintenance department, TFR facility department, uh, contract admin, parks, real estate, and technology and innovation to come up with some um, avenues of being able to identify the technology that we need in order to make those measurable decisions for the community. So basically, currently, as far as the revenue of these, it's been coming from the general fund of how we uh, purchase uh, this CAD system, and that's what we're looking to get approved. So this is just a short um, chart of our SWOT analysis talking about our strengths. So one of our goodest strengths is that we're definitely um, have 740 sworn personnel, and we're allotted for 769. We just hired uh, individuals last month and looking to uh, hire some more individuals, hoping to max that out to about 25 in December. You know, the men and women are definitely dedicated employees um, who come in every day and work hard to make sure they provide the services to the city of Tampa. And as I talked about the strength as far as 740, based on the last information I provided, the ratio of firefighters to the citizen, um, we average is on 400,000 citizen, which would be about 720 firefighters. One of the weakness we have, or one of many, um, is of course our outdated equipment. This outdated equipment deals with a lot of the data system in order for us to make um, effective, accurate response to calls to be able to determine the additional resources we need including additional stations, including equipment, including personnel. So that is one of our weaknesses that we're definitely working on. Um, the maintenance shop um, has outgrown its location, meaning it was built in 1958, and at the time I believe we only had like 15 stations. Now we are actually quadrupled that with multiple, um, close to 100 engines as well as rescue cars. Um, for the maintenance shop. So we definitely need to get that ro ro relocated so they will be in a safe environment. That's one of the major weakness that we have. And of course, opportunity deals with training. So we have a lot of opportunities that we just implemented a new learning management system, which will also assist us with obtaining the ISO rating of uh, one. Currently, we're ISO of two, so we're looking forward to that. And one of the biggest threat being a first responder, we always know it's going to be the health and wellness as well as the safety. And as I stated, one of the things we've uh, implemented when it comes to safety is to make sure that we kind of decrease the injury, on duty injuries as much as possible, and by implementing the power load stretchers that have assisted us a lot. So this actually talks about the operating. Um, budget for Tampa Fire Rescue. And if we talk about certain revenues, some of the revenues that we do receive, um, of course, is the federal grant, the SAFER grant. We've also received um, home security grants, state, local. Um, other revenues deals with our billing for when we transport uh, the PEMT, which is the um, the public emergency medical transport uh, managed care option. We al also have off-duty where we build the clients for providing the medical services at different special events. We also have the MAC deal contract as well as the um, fees for inspections, um, false alarms, and of course the contract with Pebble Creek. So these are just some of the revenues that we receive. Basically, we also received from the CIT tax, um, for the last couple of years, we received anywhere between one to two million dollars for vehicles. Of course, this year has been increased, but I want to say that was in 2021, and that came from the CIT tax. So as we talk about capital improvement, um, and for fiscal year 23, uh, two million was adopted and proposed for this year's CIP project. It's actually at 12.9 that we uh, have in the budget that's proposed. Basically, that 12.9 is gonna deal with uh, station six and station nine, and I believe it's just a typo. It wouldn't be a renovation for station nine uh, because of the condition of the station. But 
over the next five years, we have possibly close to $40 million that we've been asking for as far as the uh, CIP projects and a lot of that deals with capital improvement. Over the last year, we have um, included a lot of resurfacing at the stations, remodeling of the stations that was able to be re uh, remodeled, and that's what we're looking to continue to do. So as I draw this conclusion, you know, Tampa Fire Rescue has been around for 120 years, and of course we've been very resilient. The men and women, you know, is committed to providing a service to the Tampa Bay community, and this is our third, um, our third five-year reaccreditation, and basically it's because that we are definitely an elite department. So as far as providing resources and revenues for how we're going to continue with Tampa Fire Rescue, we just got to continue to apply for the grants, which we did. Up uh, applied for the AFG grant to assist in firefighter grant for 30 additional firefighters. Uh, we're going to continue to review our current fees that we charge and look for possibility if there can be an increase. Of course, we need to increase the funds from the general funds and continue to partner with the state and uh, local entities uh, for assistance. Uh, before we go to questions, the fire unit is in the back. Would we like to hear from uh, Mr. Stocko uh, and I'd the like other to ask unit members first. Yeah. first? Okay, we'll go to questions first from council members, and then Mr. Stocko, uh, come on up. Uh, Councilman Vieira has his hand up. Councilman Clendenin has his hand up. Go ahead, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and, and Chief. Thank you very much for that. We really appreciate you. You've been. Um, I know on the job now for some time, but you inherited a lot of challenges, and we appreciate all the work that you've done to try to get stuff done, so we appreciate it 110 um, percent. So I also wanted to ask you what I asked uh, Chief Burkhoff. So I know in the budget there were funds for TFR, several million dollars for some station improvements, et cetera. To the best of your knowledge, those are funds that were dependent on a higher millage, or would you have to defer to Mr. Rajero on that? Yeah, I will have to refer okay. to him. And the only reason why I say that um, is because I know what I, you know, put in for, but I don't yeah. know it's all broken down. Sure. I don't know the numbers. I, sure. Yes. And so, yeah, I mean, so, so you know, we've been uh, pushing for a public safety master plan uh, for a while and whatnot, and I know that you all are, are working on that, et cetera, and, and we look forward to continuing to work with you on it. You know, the the... The, the big issue, and like I, like I told the uh, administration, what I'm looking for is you take a look at what they did with the parks master plan, something of that nature. I know that takes time, et cetera, uh, with updated numbers, et cetera. You know, my, my hope was that we could have something for um, this year's budget, and then we could talk about uh, revenue to, to you know, meet those needs and whatnot. When I looked at the TFR budget, you know, I was disappointed that there weren't any specific additional fire stations. I know y'all are working on that. I saw the $650,000 uh, for um, Station 24, I believe, for Fowler and whatnot. You know, my, my challenge, which again is why I made that motion for the point three, was that what y'all wanted, right, doesn't even begin to address uh, uh, fire stations, at least in this year's budget, mm -hmm. so at least we can get that, and then we can talk about um, some some different things in the future. Can I what I that? oh, and yes, ma'am, go can ahead. I answer that? So when you say station twenty four, I thought twenty four was in. We actually been looking for twenty four. Yes, yeah. as far as yes, ma'am, Fowler. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. That, that, so that's that's what I'm saying. Yes, okay. ma'am. Yeah, and and I'm sorry, you meant. Is it? It's not allocated in the budget. No, I mean, in other words, there's no money for construction in, in this year's budget for that, oh, correct? Okay. What? The, and, and that's what I'm saying. And that's, that, that's what Got I'm it. trying to get to. That's okay. what I'm trying to get to, okay. which is when we talk about what we have to do Wednesday night is uh, when we say we're not going to cut public safety, if we're talking about what was previously allocated, sure. But then there's money that was allocated with the addition of the budget that, that, that we have to make up for if we want to keep that. If we don't, okay. fine. And again, and we're all going to work collaboratively because all of us here support public safety. But so what I want to do at the end of this is if I may make a motion where if we're not going to have additional revenue from the mill is proposed for fire stations, let's get to work on something. I know Councilman Miranda uh, brought up again the issue 
of uh, impact fees. Councilwoman uh, Hertak championed that as well. And before that, Councilman uh, Dingfelder uh, talked about that as well and championed that as well. That's one certain thing, but I want to talk about at least bonding for fire stations, something, because again, if we can't do it through present revenue, Let's just find a way, whether it's bonding, whether it's a millage, whether it's impact fees, whether we say 26 Hail Marys and it falls from the sky, whatever it is, we got to get it done. And we're all on that same page, obviously. Um, so I do want to make a motion for that as well. I have a question for you. The, the TFR, do you all do a five-year report? For the accreditation, yes. Yes, ma'am. Yes. And do you all do like a, a addendums every year on that? Or is it just every five years? Well, actually, we do a strategic plan, mm -hmm. and that strategic plan is kind of identifying the stuff that we're looking forward to do, and we do it like in a five-year increment, mm -hmm. and basically just basing it off of the last one. We yeah. started a new one, in which that's the one I'm working on. Yeah. Like I say, you know, when I got in this position, I inherited a lot, so I had sure. to, like, you know, start from the bottom and, you know, try to figure out everything that was going on, what was done prior, and what we're looking to do moving mm -hmm. forward. And when it comes to building fire stations, I'm not against it. Sure. When, when I say afford it or against it or whatever, I just think we need to just put the resources where they need to be put, you know. Sure. And if I go by how long it's going to take, if I already have land now mm -hmm. with a fire station, I need to add more resources, that's what I want to do because I mm -hmm. need to get, you know, because the station is going to take time, you oh, know. Yeah. And I'm sure. agreeing with you if, it, if we need to build it, you know, but let's – Put yeah. the resources where they need to go. Yeah, to quote Exodus, you can't make bricks without straw. Yeah. So yeah, <laughs> they're, they're, to go to the book of Exodus. So I, I, I do want a motion for that to take a look at bonds. And again, I'd rather not do that. I'll be honest, because you know debt and and and, and, and long-term payments, etc. But if that's our option, you know, for me, when it comes to public safety, I joke with people. I'm a big government guy. I am, and I make no apologies for that, because if that was my kid, if that was my wife, if that was my mom, any of us, we would want that to get done as much as possible, and whatever it costs, let's get it done. So if we have to look at bonds, if that's the option, I'm all for that. Um, so I'll be looking at that as well, and, and, uh, and revenue sources at the end of this, if I may. Um, no, but that's it, and, and the bell's telling me to shut up. Thank you. Councilman Vera, before I go to Councilman Clendenin, bonds for? Building a fire station? Yes. Okay. Uh, Councilman Clendenin, Councilwoman Hertak, Councilwoman Henderson. Um, uh, yeah, a few, a few things. Uh, and then I'll have a question for actually Mr. Perry, if he's, I saw him back there. Uh, maybe he can answer for that, about that question. Um, so uh, you may not have this answers today, but we're going to need it by Wednesday. Uh, matching funds for grants, how, what the dollar figure for that would, would need to be, we'd be able to find in the budget to be able to get that. So are you looking for all or whatever, whatever, ones, match, whoever whatever the matching, matching funds you need to be able yes. to hire the firefighters that you've got? Nothing. Yes, it's we can. So the, the firefighter is a zero match? So for the first three years, no. It's free. Okay. Okay. Good. Confirm. For the first yes. year. Okay. Yeah, for the okay. First good. Three years. Um, Paris said it's free. The first three years. How, yeah. so a dollar figure, because we have immediate needs right now on these fire stations we highlighted that needed the renovations. You have a cumulative dollar figure of what you need per fire station broken down that you, that we have. I have a tentative ballpark figure. Ballpark figure, okay. Yeah. So we. So make, because everything is. Can you make sure you email us that figure so that we know what what, the, what to be able to to be able to meet today's needs to fix the fire stations that have to be fixed today, at the to get them up to just the bare minimum standard. If you okay. have that, that'd be great. If you email us all that figure, because um, we got to find that money somewhere. Um, bonding, Mr. Perry, wouldn't we already bond this type of capital investment for fire stations? Isn't that something we'd routinely do to amortize this over the useful life of the of the building? Good afternoon, Council. Mike Perry, Budget Officer. And to answer your question, yes, it would be a combination of paygo if we had the cash, and or debt service. Yes, yeah, because so resources in the city that have a useful life, we wouldn't necessarily want to burden the current taxpayers. You want to amortize that over the, the life of that so that people who, as the city grows, future residents, it grows, they, they pay as they go, they, they pay. You're right. There's a, there's a philosophy within public finance called intergenerational equ equity. Right. And you just explained that people who are enjoying the useful life of that asset should pay. So I'll pay, my kids will pay, my grandkids will right. pay. If we pay cash, then it's all on me. 
Yeah. So that's I mean, inter intergenerational. If I'm 80 years old, I don't, I don't necessarily want to be paying something that's going to be useful for the next 40 years, and I know I'm going to be dead in five. You know, it's like, it's so. I mean, that's so. It's it's a, it is an equitable way of doing yes, this, sir, it is. and that's why I think, uh, Councilman Beer, I think it, it's already baked in the cake. Uh, bonding's baked in the cake when we when we finance these projects. It's already it's already there, so we don't have to reinvent that wheel. Thank you, Mr. Perry. Yes, sir. Um, also, your equipment needs. I know you have a couple of trucks that are operating on band-aids and bubble gum. I mean, that are really have well out spent their useful life times X number. If we could get a figure of what your absolute critical needs are for equipment replacement for your engines and I know one particular engine or and what you absolutely need to be able to meet the demands of the city and stay within the, uh, the ratio that we need to stay in. Uh, for our insurance rates and everything else that we have to stay in. I, I would appreciate those critical needs and a dollar figure for that so we know where to find that. Because as Councilman Vieira has said many times, uh, we, we support public safety, we support our police, we support our fire, and we want to do what's right by you guys. Now for the ugly side. Weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. I still know, and this is, this is me saying the baby's ugly. Go back to the next slide. Oh, yeah, let me finish the statement when we can. Uh, the baby's ugly. And that's the LMR, the labor management relationship. I think the weaknesses, opportunity, threats, you have a lot of opportunity there because you have, a, you have a, a, a very engaged workforce, which you came from. You know, that's the interesting thing. You know, I came from air traffic control background where we promoted from within. The people who are in management were air traffic controllers. We were all cut out of the same piece of cloth, right? So I think there's, an off, there's, there's weaknesses, opportunities, and threats because we need to have a really solid relationship um, across the, the team. And I really want to encourage you, and, and I want to also encourage 754 over the next 12 months to find a path that you guys can work together and, and find, like on this type of presentation, to be able to, you know, I, I would love nothing more than to see you guys collaboratively come up here and do this type of presentation together and, and both of you pitching the, the same needs and requirements for the department. I mean, I, I think that's when the, when the citizens of the city of Tampa and the taxpayers win when you guys are on the same side and you're, you're pitching with the same voice. So, you know, because you wear the boss hat, you know, the ball, unfortunately the burden, because I've been there, I know the burden falls on you because you're the one that's, you know, you're the one that wears that hat. So I really want to encourage you to do everything you can over the next 12 months as we work through this next, but this budget, which is going to be brutal and ugly, um, to do whatever you can to, to, to work so that Maybe next year you guys can be shoulder to shoulder and presenting this kind of information together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councilwoman Hertek. Councilwoman Henderson, where you're next. Okay, yes, ma'am. Um, thank you, uh, and thank you for this presentation. Uh, I appreciate the weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. It's hard to do, but I appreciate you doing that. Um, and I'm just going to candidly say the presentation from the police and the presentation from fire was so drastically different. They need new cars. Y'all need fire stations and preventative health equipment. I do not see those two on par at all. Um, it's not that I don't support what the police want, but the need for me is, is very clear that fire stations and equipment are far beyond when we look at public safety as a whole, our most important needs. Um, $40 million for replacing fire stations is less money than we're about to spend on the East Tampa Recreational Complex. I think that's absolutely doable. I completely agree with Councilmember Vieira, completely bondable, because those, as we found, some of our fire stations are 100 years old. Uh, so that is a very bondable thing for me because we're going to see, we're going to have the benefit of that 30 years from now, that station will still be there. Hopefully we will also be keeping up a little bit better with maintenance, but we will still have that station. Um, so uh, to me, uh, these priorities are just a much higher need um, and certainly not a want. So I, uh, I greatly appreciate it. I also am thrilled that we're going to be able to get 30 more firefighters and EMT without a dime out of us for the next three years as we try to dig out of this hole. I think that's very important. I think that's something that we can all say yes to incredibly easily. Um, 
And that's, that's really it. I just, I wanted to say thank you for this presentation. And I mean, we're all gonna have to look for areas that, that we're, we might, might not be a need this year, but a want. Um, so I, I, I know I'm gonna have a meeting that you'll be involved with on Friday for that. But uh, to me, um, you know, being able to think about this going into the future and the critical need and the health and welfare of the people we, that, that work for the city is really paramount, and I, I just see a drastic difference in those two. So I just want to say thank you. All right, anybody else? Yes, ma'am. T Tripp, how are you doing today? Thank Good. you so much for your presentation. Um, I think really the, a couple of things that I want to say is um, also piggybacking off of just some feedback from or comments from um, Councilman, Councilwoman Hertek. Uh, with even ve vehicles that Dr. Chief Verkaw asked for, one of the things that was presented a while ago is the fact that um, when vehicles are old, it costs more money to maintain the ones that are falling apart. So you still would consider that a high priority need because you're gonna have to fix the ones that break down anyway to keep them on the street. So just that point. And um, like Fair Oaks, as far as Fair Oaks is concerned, bonding our way out of things, we have to bond our way out of inequity and racism. And Fair Oaks Park is just one of those things. I just wanna say that. But to you, as far as the things that are needed in terms of fire rescue, the computer aided dispatch system, I think that was $7 million, correct? It was close to it, yes. $7 million. Everything that you're asking for, even the equipment to keep them safe, as I've listened to the president of your union, the, your ask is not asking for everything. Mm -mm. This is just the beginning. Mm -hmm. And even the fire stations are not included in that. And so it's important, at least for me, to say from the dais is, you know, we did not... Um, the council did not get the four votes to support the millage, and that's so unfortunate because that's why we have to have these conversations now. There is nothing that I can see um, in your budget that I would be willing to cut. So I'm, I asked Chief, Dr. Chief Burkall, and he said it was a difficult question and it was intentional for it to be. So I'm just going to ask and answer it for you. I'm not willing to cut anything that fire is asking for. I'm not willing to cut anything that the police is asking for. They've created this problem and something's going to have to get cut, but it won't be these things because public safety is our number one priority. And I heard from constantly, of course, because um, the president of the union sends tons of emails just like the citizens saying what the fire um, rescue needs and you're saying the same thing your job is just to prioritize and so that's why you're not saying oh yeah we need these fire stations you're not putting them at the top you're just putting them and saying yes we do need them but there are other priorities that's what I'm hearing and um, that's what I'm supporting and that's already provided in the budget that you presented so thank you very much for your presentation thank you, thank you very much anybody else if not I'm going to go to Mr. Stocko and the union all right Mr. Stocko yes sir Yes, sir. Uh, hey, good afternoon, uh, Council City Staff. Uh, Nick Stocko, President of uh, the Tampa Firefighters Union. <clears throat> How much time do I have? Five minutes. How much time do I have, Chair? Hello, sir. <laughs> How much time would you like? Um, reasonable amount of time. I just so I know where we'll to how to keep. Set the clock for ten minutes, and if you need more, just let us know. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, first, I want to say uh, thank you to the administration, uh, the fire chief, and the chief staff. Um, as well as the police chief on their presentation of this public safety master plan. Four years, it's been four or five years. Four or five years since it's been asked for, and I think today was the largest presentation we saw from both sides, most importantly from the fire side. It was uh, well thought out uh, with uh, laid benchmarks um, from the 2020 through the 2025 year. Um, and I want to thank Chief Tripp for also not sugarcoating the deficits of public safety. I think those uh, deficits were spelled out in 2021 in the March budget workshop meeting as they've been spelled out by the fire union over and over and over again. These deficits are not new. These deficits may be new to some of the newer council members, but they're not new to the city. I remember sitting in here in 2019 and seeing the $650,000 that we see now being allocated for fire station 24 in the 2020 budget. 
11 million dollars in fiscal year 23 to fire station 24 for construction and land and we should be having the ribbon cutting that's 11 million dollars you know we're talking about budget and cuts and and where this money is gone or going or uh, whichever but that's 11 million dollars and I hear hundred thousands we have 11 million dollars last year that were slated for a fire station the administration the fire administration asked for the land the fire administration was working with the city why are we not seeing any further progress on that and where did that 11 million dollars go if it is stuck in fiscal year 23 uh, with the powers to be if it can uh, somehow carry over to fiscal year 24 um, you know I don't know the ins and outs of that so I, I want to say that about fire station number 24 if that's the correct number in the uh, north new new Tampa area <clears throat> channel side channel side has grown so much and I, I feel like a tape recorder because it's the same thing that we've been repeating for many many years there needs to be some kind of forward thinking in a fire station in the downtown area I don't need to bust out reports and show papers. You all get the emails. I know you do. Station one was the busiest station. 32 times the tones go off. I know because I'm at station one almost every day at employee relations hearings, and I hear the buzzer go off in the middle of every hearing. 32 times on average the buzzer goes off downtown at station one. We want to talk about health and wellness. You sit in the house where the bell goes off 32 times a day when there's 24 hours in a day. That's how we can improve health and wellness. You can try to fill these stations up as much as you want, but they're already full. As Chief Tripp laid out, perfectly said, well said, we were the Tampa Fire Department. We're now a Tampa Fire Rescue. We've introduced a fire EMS-based system into stations that we're used to having horse and carriages. We need to get with the times. 1958, 1978 was when these stations were built. Without this millage that passed, now we're in even tougher times. But all of this that we're telling you, all of this that Chief Tripp is telling you, all of this that, that the fire union is telling you is not new. Chief Tripp laid out all of these deficits in 2021. Now we've got to make up for it. And I'm not going to use the phrase continuing to kick the can down the road because that's essentially what it looks like we're going to be doing. This is Tampa, Florida. This is not Bartow. I was just in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. They have a heavy rescue that's staffed. The heavy rescue downtown here has no people on it. It's got lights, trucks, uh, runs calls. There's no people on the heavy rescue for Tampa, Florida. The heavy rescue is the 911 of the 911. When the firefighters need help, they call the heavy. And I can hear those guys clapping now at Station 1. That truck has no people on it. How do we not have people on a heavy rescue? We need people. We currently have 27 vacancies from the allotted number that we have. That safer grant that's going to add 30, we're going to potentially looking at 60 vacancies as we go into the beginning of fiscal year 24 calendar. So we need to look at other avenues than just continuing to stay the same. We, we, need, we need to grow and grow stations. You're not going to be able to put any more vehicles in these stations. I talked to some of you about hurricanes. What do we do in hurricanes? We combine everybody into a station. We bring in two shifts in during OPCON, and we combine TPD. We combine TECO, water department, and what do we all do? We all jam-pack into these stations. Go to Station 14 during a hurricane OPCON. You have 40 to 50 first responders inside these stations that are having a tough time sustaining 10 to 14. Last time we were there, the power went out, and we had to run extension cords from a generator outside just to make sure that the food was cold or hot, and we went to go eat it for the three days we were there. But those are the things that we need to plan for as Tampa and as emergency managers and as the city continues to grow. What it appears to us where we're at on the docket of this body is that we're here at 4 o'clock having this conversation. These staff officers, these chief officers, all day, They've been waiting. They've got departments to run. We've waited this long in the day to be able to present our, our needs and our wants. <clears throat> the second set of bunker gear, I applaud uh, Chief Tripp and her staff. 
um, for including that in the PowerPoint. That was a union negotiated item in 2022 contract seasons that every sworn firefighter will be provided with a second set of bunker gear for the life of this agreement. We're a year into the contract. We haven't seen a purchase of bunker gear of second set, but for you union people, that's a contracted item. That's 750 sets of bunker gear that need to be purchased in the next two years. That's in our contract. Where are we going to find the money for it? What's the dollar figure on it? I'd, I'd leave it up to the experts. I believe it's around $3,000 per outfit, if I'm not mistaken. Set of bunker gear? $3,200? $4,500. Times how many firefighters? <clears throat> that's something over the next two years that's going to have to be, that's a contracted item. It's two and a half million dollars. In bunker gear. We've let one year go to the wayside to where it was intended to be broken up over the three years so the cost wouldn't all be at once. All of these deficits have been spelt out. It is a, it is a constant rewind and replay from 2021. What funding sources are we going to use to move forward? I thank Chief Tripp for meeting with the union on August 14th and August 18th. We talked about some funding sources, but we need a designated funding source for public safety, specifically fire. We don't have an enterprise fund. Our inspections, our cart fees, our special events fees, our special events fees or hourly wages essentially make money revenue for the city. It's, it's cost that the vendor has to pay for our services. But if our fees have been the same since 1978, then yeah, we need to get with the times. We're looking for designated funding sources. I appreciate the bonding. I leave those to the experts. Um, whether it's, you know, I applaud Councilman Vieira for wanting to at least keep somewhat of the millage to, to, to designate it as a fire tax. I heard some of the city staff, city legal say it can be a designated or earmarked for fire tax. I know Pasco County does it. We need a designated funding source. We cannot go another year with the potential cuts. I mean, the chief spelt it out a couple years and, and thankful that the, the chief is actually saying, yeah, we're behind. That takes a lot for a chief to say that. And we're behind. And the fire union supporting the chief on that. But what we need is we need the council support to not cut our budget and find designated funding sources. We can't continue to keep kicking the can down the road. And we need to improve these stations and improve the working conditions of, of these employees. And I know I got a minute left. I appreciate the 10 minutes that you gave me. And I'll, if I forgot need, something, I'll remember more, later. But, but no, if you got any questions. Do we have um, any questions? Yes, sir. Councilman Vieira, Clendenin, Carlson. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And, and, and Nick, I wanted to thank you and all you, the folks who are here today. Um, you know, when I think about what a union uh, should do, and I think we have three union members here. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, three. You're one of the three yeah, uh, union members. Um, and and um, so I've... I've never been in a union myself, but you're, you're number one supposed to protect the interests of the workers and, and, and their welfare, but also help them in the work that they do. And, and you're obviously doing that because you have such a passion for public safety. And I, and I thank you for that 110%. So our, our, the job before us, and that's why I'm bringing up bonding, it's really big. Um, so when uh, Councilwoman Henderson just said, I'm not cutting anything from public safety, the, the, the statement should be, uh, uh, when that she refuses to cut anything, and I don't want to speak on your behalf, but I'm saying how I understand it. Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm not willing to cut anything from the increase that was dependent on the millage. So in other words, by virtue of getting rid of the, the millage, even the, the smaller amount sought for, for public safety, right, um, we're, we're having to look at other cuts and other areas for this as well as other areas. Again, a big challenge that we have, and that's why I bring up bonding which is to say, look, let's take care of, I, I don't care how it's done, let's just get it done. And that's why I put myself on the line politically for that, uh, because I'm willing to do it. I'm willing to do it because it's, it's an important issue. Um, so I'll, I'll be looking at that as well as the, the uh, dedicated funding issue. Um, but, uh, but again, I appreciate y'all's advocacy. Uh, since I've been here in city council, I've worked with uh, uh, Steve Suarez, who's a great guy. 
wild man, David Lee Roth, Joe Greco, God bless him, great guy. And, and, and now, oh, and Andrew, and Andrew Carter, and now you, and all of y'all do a great, a great job. And, um, and I'm glad to see, by the way, that there's, um, the, the, there's something, I don't wanna say something building, because it's already there, but that there's a lot of eye to eye with management and labor right now, as I see it, because there is an admission of deficits. I don't think anybody denies it. It's just how are we gonna take care of it? And my view is, like I said, if it's bonding, let's do bonding. If it's 12 Hail Marys and 12 Our Fathers, let's do that, but let's just do it and get it done. It's so important. Thank you very much. Before I go to the other council members, I, I just had a, a thought. You know, we talked about a public safety impact fee, which was brought up by Councilman Miranda and, and, and other council members in Vieira, which I totally support. And talking about a, a dedicated funding source, uh, if this is even possible to do, we send out utility bills every month for water, whatnot. Are we legally allowed to uh, add, let's say, a dollar a month, two dollars a month to that, that would go to public safety, could we do that via the utility bill or is that just a total pie in the sky idea? That's just an idea that I had. How do we, how do we get that where it's not a, a property tax? It would be a fee. You know, it'd be a fee, but it would go to, and I know, you know, police and fire through the county, through the, you know, they get stuff, but this specifically going to revenue that we can collect monthly, that would clearly add up. Um, Mr. Shelby, I know it's a it's a CFO question. It is a CFO question. I do know, and it's been referenced that that Florida statutes does um, allow for um, a fire fee, um, and um, and also there are other ways you can do it. But you're raising an issue that I hadn't uh, contemplated, which is adding it to a, a utility bill. And I guess that's a CFO question, or that's a legal question, Mr. Massey. Might and the reason the reason I ask, you know, on a utility bill, because if it's not a lump sum, as something would be on a property tax bill, you know, as you get your trim notice at the end of the year, which is a bigger impact, if somebody sees a dollar, two dollars, three dollars, whatever it is, um, that would go to a fire fund. If state statute allows that, the utility bill is something that I'm thinking of, where it makes it less impactful and easier on the consumer when they're saying, a dollar increase or two dollar increase, but it's going strictly to uh, when we're talking about a dedicated funding source. I'd like to know if, some, if that's something that we can do because when you talk about hundreds of thousands of utility customers each month, and it's let's say it's a dollar, it's hundreds of thousands of dollars. Let's say it's two hundred thousand dollars a month. At the end of the year, two times twelve. That's tw you know that's two and a half million dollars almost. I'm just throwing a number out. That pays for the bunker gear. That pays for if we're bonding. Well, that's the question. The that's question. the mortgage payment for the bond, essentially. That's but where I was going to. I was, I'm sorry to interrupt, but that's where I was going to head. Um, that if you have that funding source, it has to be a recurring funding source because the the need is today, not something that on a, a monthly basis will accumulate. If, but if you want to do that, it has to be something that can actually be in a position of able to be bonded as a recurring um, revenue source. And that's a, that's another question. Because if it's recurring. You know the bank, the the the, the, the who you know what, who gives the money sees that you have you know, the city has the income to pay that back or fund whatever or use towards matching X, but it can be if it has to be a fire fund as you say per state statute again question for the CFO yes. and if we can do that, you know we see how gas prices fluctuate. It could be four dollars and fifty cents a gallon. It could be three ninety five a gallon. But if it's something minimally impactful which is a dollar, two dollars, whatever it is. I'm just throwing out numbers. I'm, I'm thinking out loud here, but we can dedicate it towards fire. I think that allows us to create that dedicated funding source. I'm just, thinking yeah, I was thinking about, I understand. I was thinking about it at lunch and I'm going, how can we be creative and how can we generate money? Beyond looking at, you know, we talked about increasing fee. We haven't looked at fees. That's another thing. Not talking parks and rec. I'm talking about everything that you mentioned. Uh, why aren't those changed? Uh, when someone pulls a permit, how many permits do we issue a day? Um, that's another thing. Not talking about fire, but uh, you know, at lunch, I'm brainstorming how we get to where we need to be without that millage and how we can be, make, we be making meaningful change because you talk about dedicated funding source. When we put money in the general, into general revenue, that money can be moved around. I want something like, you have an enterprise fund, which we can't touch those, like parking and whatnot, why not something for public safety? Why not something specifically for fire? And I think it would, you know, it would ease the burden. But again, thinking out loud, who is next? I forgot. It was a Clendenin, okay, and then, yeah, okay. 
I'm just going to say a tax is a tax is a tax is a tax. Yeah. <laughs> we had an opportunity, <laughs> and, it, <laughs> and, and, and it, it lost it, uh, on those days. You know, um, I'm, I'm sorry. I, you know, I keep seeing all these dollar figures fly before my eyes, and, I, and, and the chief spoke about the, the CAD system, $7 million for the CAD. Can you talk about how important that would be to, the, to, your, to your members of having that equipment in your vehicles? Yeah, I believe the CAD and the AVL has been overdue since 2015, 2016. Can you tell people what you're doing now because you don't have that? If you have to respond to a fire, how you're getting navigational assistance? Sure. So um, the lights will turn on in the station. The tones will go off. We walk over to a printer or run. And when we make it to the printer, we grab the paper and then we read the paper and it'll tell you the type of alarm it is the address, who you're going with, and a box number. You then go into the vehicle, you grab the radio, you wait to be able to go through if it's available or not, you tell them you're responding, and you begin to travel to the call. In route to the call, if there's any updates, you have to receive those via the radio because that's the only part that's electronic. There's no On a two-way radio, the you yes, have to one wait for channel, a clear channel. Unless it's a fire or something with three units or greater, that gets a separate tack. Okay. It's one channel, 92,000 calls, BLS companies, everybody's on one channel. This is the kind of stuff you heard that they did in the 1970s, not in 2023. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's just, just crazy. Yeah. Dispatch I, has no way of seeing where the vehicles are. Yeah. So you have to call them and ask where the vehicles Which we are. can track UPS trucks, we track our garbage trucks, but we can't track our fire trucks. It's just, it's crazy. And, and I, I think that's what I want to emphasize the people that are listening today. When we talk about the need, these are needs of the city, not wants. These are things that should have been fixed decades ago. And we're sitting here in 2023 talking about basic things that I guarantee every single person that's listening here today has an ability to navigate in their truck and has an electronic means to communicate in their truck that our fire department does not have. I mean, they, they have an ability to get to the grocery store with electronic equipment that our fire department doesn't have. It's just insanity to me that we've allowed the system over these decades of, of neglect to get to where we are today. Um, Something you brought up that I just have to ask, you said you had extension cords. Do, do our fire stations not have uninterrupted power sources? They do have generators in the fire installations or in the fire facilities. However, as you can imagine, um, from stations being built in 58 and in the 70s, these generators are old. I believe in this current capital improvement, and I would defer to the experts, that there is some generators that are being uh, purchased and, and redone because um, the generators at that time were bad, but I believe they are in the process of reworking like five generators or so. Okay. You know, and I, I've just, I've just got to, I've just got to, because I've got to vent for a second. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to channel my coworker over here in my venting. Mm -hmm. um, that wasn't you, you know, I haven't yet. You know, so we were up here a couple of nights ago and we talked about this budget and the dire consequences that the, the departments are in. And, you know, I've gotten the same type of emails that Councilman Beer spoke about, people criticizing decisions about what we, the positions and stances we took. It's because clearly I see the needs of the city. Clearly I see the deficits that we're in. I see the decades of neglect. Somebody's got to step up to the plate to fix it. And you know what? I didn't run for city council the first time to worry about getting reelected the second time. I'll be damned if I'm going to be somebody that sits in Washington, D.C., worried about my reelection rather than the good of the people that they represent. And every day that I sit on this dais, it has absolutely nothing to do with me. It's about the people in the city of Tampa and my grandchild that's going to grow up here to make this city better. So when we're looking at this, and we're, this is real money, and I don't think people understand. We signed off on obligations in this city that are coming due that exceed the property valuation. People say, oh, we can find the money because we have increased property valuations. Well, guess what, everybody? That's already been taken. It's already been spoken for. There is no excess money this time. So every single dollar you heard tonight talking about fire, every single dollar you heard tonight talking about police, it's gonna have to come from our existing skin. And guess what? That skin has been skinned since the 2008 Great uh, Recession. We haven't, re we haven't recovered from that fully yet. So there's not much skin left on this beast. 
And I'm afraid that these cuts that we're going to have to entertain next Wednesday, I hope these people come with their pencils sharpened because they've got, a, they've got a task in front of them to find those cuts. And they're going to have to look at the people of the city of Tampa and say, you know what? I'm sorry. I'm sorry we're going to have to cut this program. I'm sorry we're going to have to cut this. I'm sorry we're going to have to close that pool. But we don't have any other choice because we won't have the money to pay for it if we want to protect the safety of the people of Tampa. Councilman Carlson. I was going to talk about some other things, and I will, but, um, you know, I respect the, the differing opinions of my colleagues, but we had this discussion the other day, and we made a decision. And um, uh, it seems like the message of the day for the administration, which they're pushing out all over the place, is, well, this is city council's fault. Nanner, 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 you didn't listen to us, so we're going to punish you. Uh, you know, who they're punishing is the people of the city. Um, this, is, uh, th this is a situation like, you know, any of you have had employees before. Imagine your employee comes to you and says, hey, I maxed out my credit card and I bought a house that's too expensive and I need a raise. The thing you say to them is, hey, that's a personal decision. That's not, that's not my fault. No, I need a raise. I need a raise. But if you don't give me a raise, I'm just not going to show up at work. Or I'm going to show up at work and not do anything. And that's the attitude that we're getting from the administration, not the staff at the top. Uh, you know, the, um, the, 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 the boss here is the people of the city. The, the people of the city clearly said they don't want us to destroy the economy. They don't want us to push thousands of people out of their homes. We have, a, we have a, 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 a promise to the people to protect them and protect them from overspending. We're not in this situation because city council made a bad decision despite all the spin on TV and everything. We're in this position because this administration wasted millions of dollars. They, they put in debt that they didn't even tell city council about um, until the last minute. They, they uh, spent way too much money on too many projects. The last administration did the same thing. During the greatest boom in American history, economic boom in American history, the last administration spent half the reserve fund, which we're trying to replace now. The, the problem is overspending and spending on vanity projects or pet projects. You know, we, the last administration built a $12 million boathouse. That could have, how many fire trucks could that have bought? Even if it's only five or six, that's still more than we have right now, but we built a boathouse that competes with other private sector uh, venues for events. It's insane the amount of money that's been wasted in this. And the, the, what the, just like the boss in the scenario that I said, the boss would say, you go fix your own problem. And so my vote the other night, and by the way, two months ago, before we did that vote, I told the administration, it's on TV, so people can go back and watch it. If you, ra if you propose raising the rate, I'm going to vote against it. And I'm going to tell everybody I know in the community to not support it because we don't need to. You need to stop spending so much money. Stop wasting all the money. And so what we're doing is holding this administrative administration accountable. And next week is going to be tough. But if the, if the mayor tells two or three of my colleagues to show up and not sharpen their pencils, we're in big trouble. If the administration tells the staff not to work with us in the next few days because they want to show us up and prove a point, we're in, this community is in big trouble. Who's going to suffer? The people of this community. People of the community said not that, oh, please don't raise my rate because I don't want to pay more. They're saying, please don't let me kick, get kicked out of my house. Seniors are crying and pleading with us that they didn't want that. The businesses and, and people that can barely scrape by said, please don't destroy our economy. That's the decision we made. And so what we're going to do is we're going to go back and work together with the administration, I hope, to figure out what can we do. The, the bad decisions of the past are in the past, but we can, de we can decide what we're going to do going forward. And there are revenue options and cost options, but there are a lot of really, really bad decisions that this council tried to stop. Let me ask you, Mr. Stocko, we talked several times before last week. Um, were you happy with, the, with what was covered in the mill increase? Did you think that satisfied the problems that you see in the fire department? I think we've had these issues way before this millage increase was proposed. But was everything, you? did everything, so the administration is going out telling people, you know that we would have repaired your roads if city council had not voted against this. It's not true and it's an exaggeration. We, we have billions of dollars worth of road repair that we have to fix. We have lots of money that we have to fix in fire rescue. And as I understood it from you, this was, even with the millage increase, it was only going to put a small dent in it. You weren't happy with, with it. You wanted us to try to find more, correct? Absolutely. We need more increased revenue fund uh, resources, but this millage would have helped, in our opinion, because we've been having the same issues in 2021 without the millage. So obviously something is being done at this table or in these chambers or in the building across the street 
that those funds aren't being allocated for So last fire. year, you, you mentioned the new fire station, which uh, my colleague, Councilmember Vieira, advocated for for a long time, and I think Goods did also. Uh, you said the money was in the budget. City Council supported you. As far as I can remember, City Council's always supported what the fire union wanted. It's in the capital improvement. It's $11 million for fiscal year 23. It's, it's, we're not the ones who made the decision not to build it. The administration made the decision not to build it. So we can come here. I'm just making it clear for all your members. We are, we're behind you. We want to support you. We need the administration to cooperate. And I hope that the people that had to sit here all day, I hope they'll also go meet with the mayor and say this is a priority. And I don't blame it on the fire chief either. The fire chief's trying to be an advocate for all of us. But we need the mayor and the administration to take this seriously, understand that people's lives are at stake, and they need to stop wasting money on things like Hannah Avenue and put the money in saving people's lives. Thank you. Thank you very much. Was it Vieira or uh, Councilman Miranda? Go ahead, sir. Thank you, and thank you for the job you're doing. I know it's very difficult. Not only today, yesterday, and tomorrow will be just as difficult more. Uh, we have a spending problem connected with a problem that we have in revenue. Both of them are problems. You, you see, sitting here for many years, this problem started in 1996. 27 years ago, when we gave everything away. We gave away that every time there's an event somewhere, you good gentlemen from the fire and the good people, also ladies and gentlemen from the fire and police department, go and work those events. And those events are paid solely by the city of Tampa taxpayers. No, no problem with you, you're doing a job. When you look at, we've given away parking, we've given away parking garages in a, in a way, we've given away a 30 year contract where you can't have, you're talking about people getting evicted, we all know that's happening. About a third year lease where there's no rent increase. That happened in 1996. I'm not blaming them. I'm not for everything, nor I'm against anything. I'm just trying to say the facts. And when you go back and look at these contracts, you say, what happened then? Well, everything was fine until it tickles, tickles, tickles. The cost of living goes up. This stays what it is, trickle, tickle, tickle. And the government gets further and further behind. So when you do that, and no part of yours, not at all, in fact, you've all been very courteous, I'm not against them, <laughs> but you can't let this happen again. We cannot let this happen again. Every time there's an event somewhere, I'm going to speak of generality. Somewhere along the line, you don't have one penny invested but yet the two, first $2 million go to you. How do you like that deal? you like to have that for the fire and police department. We don't have it. After that, anything over that is split 50-50. But you didn't put one penny in it. I'm not blaming anybody. I'm blaming everybody for not understanding what those things mean. Talking about kicking the, the can down the road. When until that 30th year gets here, the can is going to get bigger and your leg ain't going to be able to even move it because the can weighs too much. When you look at the things that government has done to promote itself, people don't come here because there's something different. They come here because throughout the years, many years for whatever reason, it was discovered to be, oh, nice weather. Nice beaches, close by, nice environment. You can buy a house for $12,000, $15,000. You can't even buy a toilet now for $15,000. Right? Within the bathroom. I see, I caught you there. Okay. <laughs> I, was, I, 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 I was fixing my toilet the other day. All right, but you didn't pay so. $15,000. Right. But a bathroom will cost you $15,000, which is true. A small bath, I don't mean an elaborate one, I mean one 10 by 10. Close to $15,000. So what am I saying? We thought it was a dream, and the dream is here. It's great. It's wonderful. All those things now come at the end, and that's why we're at work. It doesn't take one year to do it. No, it takes a long time for that finally to catch up with you. And guess what? The axes have crossed, and therefore we're at the axis like this of what to do and not to do. So we're the ones that are paying for it. In fact, it was Tampa that started not with the owners, but with a prior owner by giving 25% of the parking away. 
So historically, it's there. Nobody wants to talk about it. The facts are there. Prove it on paper. Now you get zero in parking, they get it all. What a, what a wonderful contract. Wish you had that. If we had just a different contract, we wouldn't be sitting here today talking about your department that needs anything to fix the problems with the people of Tampa, nor the police department with crime and trying to keep it where it's manageable. Crime is never manageable, just like your ambulance is going somewhere, it's never manageable. You're late 30 seconds and that person passed away. But not only do you have an equipment problem, you got another problem called traffic. No matter what you used to do before, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, you can't do it now if you had a motorcycle getting to where you're going. Because the traffic is unbelievable. The potholes are unbelievable. The synchronization of the city is unbelievable. The things that you need are unbelievable. Not because of you, because of the necessity that we put ourselves in throughout the 30 year span. And I see somebody from finance, if they, can, if they think that I'm saying something out of line, please correct me. So all those things are there that we've done. And we said, but what happened? All you had to do was read that contract. I'm not against them. I'm against us for what we did to ourselves. We were self-inflicted by getting something that you thought was the greatest thing in the world. It's great. People come in, but they used to come in in groves and stay in the motels and hotels. You know what happened? One little line in that contract changed. And then the venue used to be 60-40. Now it's all 100%. So that's what happened. One little line, few words. So I'm not blaming them, I'm blaming us. Them was looking out for their benefit, like all, everyone should do in business. I'm not blaming them, I'm blaming us for doing what we did to ourselves. This is not a direct 100% cause of this, but I guarantee you the majority cause of this is what happened and will continue to happen. Because somewhere in our minds, no one's happy unless things happen. We have a problem here that's going to be very difficult to solve. But I still think we can solve it, even with all the things working against us. If this tax today and the one that's coming up in a year or two years or three years, if that one fails, then you're going to have a real big problem. All of us are going to have a real big problem. We cannot continue to do business the way we do business. And I'm not saying there's anything crooked. I'm not saying there's anything wrong. We just got to understand what you got elected to do. You got elected to serve the citizens. And if somebody else wants to be part of that citizenship, then they have to join the club by paying. I don't mind putting a fire and police, like I said the other day to the council members and to the ones over here, to raise the money and the new people coming in, they have to pay a certain fee. I don't mind looking at the rest of the five or six other items that I spoke about, but that's only a small band-aid <laughs> to help you and your men and women that work with you to have a fair life and a fair family operation like I've had with mine. And that's all I want. I, that, that's all you want. You just want to have the police and the fire, nowhere in any city. If you have terrible police and fire, is that city going anywhere? It can't because the people will not stay there and the people that are not staying in, certainly no one's gonna come replace them. So you must have fire and police together to make a city. That's number one. Number two, when you look at downtown Tampa, back in the 70s, the sidewalk would be picked up at 5.30 in the afternoon because there was no one downtown. You just mentioned the, the construction and the people that, have, you know, we were dead, dead. The only thing we had here was a few drunks. That's it. Tumbleweed. And tumbleweed. And I'm not going to use the other word, but thank you for reminding me. <laughs> Those things you had. So now what was nothing is built up where you have to double 
your exposure, what you have, what you need. Same thing with the police department. There was no one living here. 600 people. They were in jail over there, not by the interstate. That was it. So what I'm saying, in, in a few years, this city has changed so much and it's brought so much value on itself that no one's going to, not, not us seven, not us eight, I should say, are going to let it happen and let it fall completely. You know, I don't question anyone's vote ever here. They got elected to serve. But I think between the eight, all of us have the same objective to meet all your goals or the best of the goals, not only of yours, but of the police department. No city or no entity, no government can be a government if they don't have a strong fire and police department. I don't care who you are and what you say. It doesn't happen. So somehow, between now and Wednesday, we're going to find a way. We don't have a revenue problem. We have a spending problem, which becomes a revenue problem because now the revenues are going up, but not as quick as the need for the public because you had an acceleration of influx of a lot more. And these are the things you do. What happens if you go buy a two by four when everybody's a two by four? What is it when you go buy gas when there is no gas? The price of gas becomes what? Sky high. That's exactly what happened in the home business. That's exactly why we have a crisis. That's exactly what's happening because more people come in to buy and there's no more housing. And there's nothing being built to facilitate all the needs that we have. You're chasing yourself. That's not you, sir. I'm talking about generality. Please, I'm not talking to you. But what I'm saying is we, we got to understand where we're at, and some people can get red in the face and talk all they want. Don't bother me at all. You can say I was an idiot. You can say I did the wrong thing, the right thing. We're marching together. We may not be on the same page yet, but sooner or later, those fabulous eight or the unfabulous eight, depending how you voted on the people's eyes, you're going to get there sooner or later. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Uh, Councilwoman Hertex and Councilwoman Henderson, and we'll wrap it up. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to answer your question about the $11 million for fire station number 24. I, that was, when I talked about CIP, I had two separate meetings with the CFO and chief of staff really focused on, um, two, most, both of them were two hour meetings talking about the budget. And, uh, and I often, I use that example because it's the one that we've used the most, uh, the CIT. Okay, so what happened is fire station 24. And sure enough, I got a, I got a page that said, you know, fiscal year, or yeah, FY 2022, and it had it in there. It had funding from CIP tax, and we approved that, but the administration chose not to go forward with it. And that really lies on us, the seven of us, to follow up, to keep up, to make sure that things that are in the CIP are done the way we want them to do, to be done. And I will absolutely take responsibility for last year's budget and not focusing, I mean, I was, I was four months on council. I barely knew the names of the directors, I'll be perfectly honest. But uh, if I had known then what I know now, I would have done things quite differently. Uh, and, you know, that's, that's the reality of it. Uh, we're, we're only, we're not even 10 years away from having less than $1 billion budget for this city. There's no excuse for why we can't provide for our citizens. We're right, we have a spending problem in this city. We're not spending on the priorities that the citizens have asked us to spend on. We spent you know, $122 million on a building we really didn't need. Like we could have kept going renting. Maybe it wouldn't have been better in the long run, but we had more pressing needs. And so I just wanted to answer that for you. And I also wanted to let you know what the bonding capability is. Ms. Travis is right behind you. And she was talking about for housing with 9.1 million that we can leverage that, if I'm correct, to get about one, 130 million. Now, we wouldn't necessarily need all that, and she wouldn't do that the very first year, but it, that's the kind of leverage that we can get. Now, obviously, we don't want to bond everything because then we're stuck with that, those payments over time. But $40 million, when you're looking at that, is not that much money in terms of what we can bond. If we make that a priority this, this session, we can absolutely get started. Um, I spoke to Chief Tripp uh, about the amount of fire stations you would want down at a time, and she agreed that two maximum or what you would want to be rebuilt at the same time in order to make sure that you, know, you aren't 
you know, all living in a trailer on those properties. So, you know, if we could get a great calendar going for replacing two stations every year at a cost of between seven to nine million dollars, absolutely, that can be done. And that's going to depend on us to make sure we stay on top of that priority. And because it's very true, we can put money in the budget, but if the administration doesn't want to spend it, they won't. And so it relies on all of us to keep our eye on it. And so my promise to you is that I'm going to keep my eye on it to the best of my ability. Councilwoman Henderson. Yeah, it's my turn. Nick. Um, this is an interesting time to be a neophyte on city council. Um, I'm not a politician. Um, I'm a, I am an educator and a single mother and a caregiver. So I kind of think of things that differently. I'm not worried about an election next year, which is why I did support the millage. Now I kind of wish that I would have seconded um, Council Mem Member Vieira's motion for his small millage increase. I actually wish I would have seconded that so we could have at least had the discussion um, and address the needs of fire and police. Uh, and that was a neophyte error. So I want to just say that just like um, you know we're just learning but one of the things that I appreciate in your presentation is the fact that local um, 754 and the chief and her administration you all are beginning to collaborate a little bit more and I think that's really important especially in a critical time as this um, because the needs are so great for fire and I said it in our, my earlier comments about um, you know, not wanting to take a dime away from the budget and the requests that have been made because it's all about public safety. Um, having, I'm coming from the perspective of living with a 92 year old mother where I have called fire and rescue seven times in two years. And I want them there and I want her at the hospital as quick as possible. That's what I want. And so uh, the only way that that can happen is if all cylinders are working within fire and rescue and that takes funding and that's just really important to me. I don't want to even consider that uh, I don't want to hear anything except you getting her where she needs to be, where she needs to be, when she needs to be there. And so um, anyway, there's, there, hey, by the way, there's nothing wrong with trailers. Staying in a trailer to get a new fire station, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, the other thing that I wanted to say is, aside from, um, gosh, my notes are all over the place now. Like I think this. I think I'll just leave it at that. But thank you for your presentation, and I support fire at the current budget request that currently exists. Council Member Vieira, if you'd like to close this up. Yes, sir, and I appreciate that, Mr. Chair, very much. I wanted to. Um, I, I had a, well, long story short, I got to leave for a family issue with my mom and a doctor's appointment. I had to get the poor woman an Uber, um, so I got to go pick her up. But I, I know, I know. But um, yeah, um, but I wanted to make a couple motions on, on this issue, but I want to um, respond to something from Councilman Carlson. I, I just want to make sure that, that we have parameters, I guess, if you will, on this issue. Uh, in, in, in terms of the mayor, the mayor's people, all that kind of stuff, which is, you know, I, I, I walked in on, I guess it was Tuesday, 100% dedicated to voting against the 1.0 or anything near it. I opposed what the mayor was trying to do. My intention, which I stated very clearly from day one, was to have a significantly reduced millage uh, that would primarily benefit public safety. We could talk about cuts for things like affordable housing, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Councilman Carlson came out from day one and said, no new taxes. Uh, um, you know, his position, my position, formed early, et cetera, both were to varying degrees. His 100%, mine 70%, I guess what the mayor said. Um, but, but I want to be clear that when I say things, I haven't talked to the mayor's people about this. Uh, I, sometimes I side with the mayor, sometimes I don't. Early this year, I voted to override not one, not two, not three, not four, but five vetoes from the mayor on the charter. Um, we don't always agree, right? Um, so what I'm saying here is, is from myself 100% because 
Tuesday could get emotional. People, the tempers could flare. I just want to make sure that Wednesday. we. Wednesday. I keep on saying, I'm sorry. I don't mean to you show mess y'all up. You up on Tuesday. You're going to be, you, you, you have a much better meeting. Yeah, I know, right? There you go. Um, I, I just want to make sure, and, and, it, and, I, and I respect Councilman Carlson 100% and his you know, success on these issues in no ways encumbers mine. Uh, but but I, I just, just my, my opinion in that regard that I'm not talking to the mayor's office about or anything of that nature. I, I, and, and with regards to prior spending, my issue always is city council passes, the mayor signs a law and always said that the, any mistakes that we've made um, that I never want our first responders to pay for it. That's, that's always been my view. But if I may, I do want to make just a quick motion on number one, um, and, and we can have this come back the second week in December. I'm just making that up. Let me get um, this calendar. Go ahead, sir. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Um, and thank. You. And by the way, Mr. Chair, great meeting today so far. We'll see how, when it ends at eleven. We, no, have this, but, we have Pearl Harbor Day. Pearl Harbor Day. Okay, there December you go. 7th. If I may, for that. So number one, a, a, a motion for administration to come back with a proposed plan of action for bonding of future fire stations and public safety needs. Uh, for the steps taken to be doing that, etc. Um, number two is for, and I'm going to exclude uh, the. Yeah, so I'm sorry, so let's do that. That's number one. Oh. We have a second from, I was going to second it, but Councilwoman Hertek with the second. Any discussion on that? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? And then your second? December 7th, under staff report, 2023. Yes, sir. And then, and I'm going to exclude um, that whenever, you know, whenever, I'll tell you what, how about this? Uh, Councilman Miranda wisely brought up the uh, issue of uh, public safety impact fees. What day is that coming? Is that December 7th? Mm -hmm. When I'll tell you what, let's do this. I'll, I'll talk to the administration about making sure that they put in all revenue sources, not just public safety impact fees, um, whether it's fees or a $10, 10 cent tax on baseball cards, whatever, um, that, that, we can, that we can look at. Um, so I'll, I'll, we can handle that offline. Um, then the next one is, and this is the last one, is um, a request for consideration of a one-year addendum uh, for the five-year report from Tampa Fire Rescue so that we can review the progress. It's a request for fire uh, to do that. doesn't need to come back because um, I know y'all don't want to, you know, uh, limit your time, et cetera. So I, I would make that request because having a one-year addendum as opposed to every five years um, helps supplement the master plan idea, I would say. So that's my motion. And when, what, what date was that, sir? And we don't need that to come back, I think. It would be a request. Okay. Um, and then we can work with TFR when that comes back to us, because I don't, you know. We have a motion from Councilmember Vieira, second from Councilmember Miranda. All in favor? Uh, Aye. Any opposed? Thank you very much, sir. Can, yes, sir. Sorry, I just wanted to respond to three things very quickly. Um, one is, as we get into budget and budget positions, uh, the airport and McDill, or contracted apparatuses. So we do get re full reimbursement for about 53 employees to keep that in mind for next Wednesday. Okay. The other is if we can do a capital facilities master plan, we don't need data, we don't need run volume, we don't need response times. The stations, the years were built, the years the stations were built have not changed. If we can do a plan just strictly off facilities, fire station facilities, and how those need to be improved. That'd be a great Councilman start. Councilman Vieira, would you like to make that motion? No, I hate five. I'm just, yeah, I'll, make, <laughs> I'll, make, I'll make that motion come here for the capital facilities uh, master plan uh, for it to come back to us on December 7th as well. December and by 7th the way, like if you guys need more time, please, I'll give y'all whatever y'all want. But that's it. Councilman Vieira with the motion. Second, Councilman Miranda, all in favor? Aye. 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 Councilman Carlson, you had a comment? Okay. Yeah, just, just real fast. Um, December 7th, under staff reports. And, and just a clarification, time. the capital facilities is solely for Tampa Fire Rescue. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. Chief, Chief Tripp, when you, in your presentation, you talked about the, uh, the accreditation um, document that you send over. Um, I don't remember seeing that before. Sorry if I missed it, but... Is it possible you could, I, I won't make a motion, but could you just send that to us also? Because it sounds like it has some of your aspirations and planning in it. Uh, you mean the standard of cover? The so document that you supply to, to, for your reaccreditation. Oh, okay. Just so we could, because it sounded like it has some of your strategy and ideas. The, the last thing, um, we, we, all, we all talked about um, the political aspects of, of this a little bit. Um, uh, you know where I where I come from on the budget is a is just a deep philosophical feeling. We all sometimes do that. Um, I, 
I don't care if I ever get reelected anything. Obviously, I say a lot of things up here that show that. Um, uh, um, but, um, but what I called chief of staff 1.30 or 2, whatever it was when we left the other morning, and I said, look, um, nobody won and nobody lost tonight. We all lost and we all won. I said the mayor won because she proposed a solution. Um, it wasn't a complete solution, it was a partial solution, so, but she won and that she proposed something. It showed leadership that she did that. I said tomorrow what we can say is that, uh, what she can say is look, I proposed something and the community and city council decided not to do it. So now we have to work with what we have. This, the city council didn't win, we had to, had to go through seven hours of arguments and, and public comments and thousands maybe of emails and everything. We didn't win either. There's no winner or loser in this. The, we also lost that we don't have the money to do these things. But we have to make a, ju a judgment, uh, you know, just like the parable of Solomon and the baby, we had to make a judgment about, about what do we do. And, and, and we, the majority of us, chose one path. It, do, it, it doesn't mean that one is better than the other in the long term, we'll see. But the one other way the mayor wins is that we have a better chance of surviving this recession that's coming right now by not adding cost to our economy. I still think we're gonna get hit pretty hard and the numbers lag where we are. But the other thing I said to Chief of Staff, and I also called him again the next morning, I said there are two ways this is gonna go going forward. Either the mayor's people come out and they're defensive and argumentative and political and they say, let's show city council, put them in their place and, and let's not work with them and let's let them fail next Wednesday. Well, that will send us into all kinds of problems. And, he, and the chief of staff said, yeah, I don't want that either. I said, I'm sure the mayor doesn't want that. The other path is for the mayor to call her staff and say, two weeks from now, I want to have a press conference with the chair of city council, Guido Menescalco, and announce that, that although the community and city council did not like the proposal I made, we worked together over these past two weeks and we protected the five things that I proposed. And that's what we need to do. We need it now is a time for leadership, not politics. We need to work on how do we how do we solve this problem? We are facing a very difficult situation. The decision on how much we have was made already. Now let's please work together. This is this can be in two weeks, this can be a win for the mayor, can be a win for city council, and most importantly, a win for our community. Thank you. Councilmember Carlson, I thought about that today. I said, what if we did that? The mayor, chair of city council, all of city council, that we've come to a, a conclusion with the budget. Uh, we've met in the middle, whatever it is, but it's everybody wins. Most importantly, the people of Tampa win uh, and, and us making a, a better or the best decision. You know, I, I try to get along with everybody. I always keep that open mind, and I think that's something that we could, we could do. So hopefully we will get there. I have to. Yeah, Mike. I was going to say, I really have to run because I'm 20 minutes away and that's when I need to be there. Go ahead, I, I have that ordinance that Justin Vasky was going to present on. Can someone please motion to, to continue it sometime in, what the, what the hell are we in, September? In October, Justin, I, I apologize. I do. Uh, can someone do that for me, please? All right, let us let me do that real quick. I'll, I'll do it if I may. Is this uh, about the, uh, the salaries? Yeah, the 28th Amendment weird thing I want to do. Um, if I may, I motion to continue that. Can to we do November 2nd? There you go. This is uh, the number on the agenda under staff. Yes, we have a motion. This is going to be for November 2nd under staff reports. Mr. Vasquez, we apologize and we thank you for your patience. So uh, we have a motion by Councilmember Vieira, second by Councilmember Miranda. All in favor? Aye. All right. We have some. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I just want to say um, my concern is. Of course, I have no problem working with staff. I have evidence of that um, every time I meet with them. But my concern is that they are the area, they, they are the experts in their particular uh, perspective fields, but $45 million is a lot to cut, and my fear is someone's going to lose their jobs. That's my fear. When you're looking for $45 million and you're saying that there's waste, I just don't see that being in purchasing things. I see that in human capital. And that is my biggest fear regarding what we're being asked to do. And we're asking staff to do that. And that is going to be very difficult um, if that's going to be the case. There was something else I wanted to say, but I'll just leave it at that. And Mr. Shelby, I was gonna ask if it would be appropriate for me to make a motion that before next Wednesday, we get under personnel in the budget what new positions are being uh, requested in this upcoming budget that have not been 
filled, what that dollar amount is. I'm sorry? Yeah, it's right there. No, 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 that's, that's what I want to look at. Not people that are here existing, yeah, but it's, it's what is being proposed. And what, I think that's... It's in know, the budget. Yeah, that, we can, well, that can, we that can, can be, look at So you, you, you're asking it to be pulled out and made available in advance of the budget? I mean, what I happens... Mean, if it's already can, there, I can, I can do it and I can go through it, but yeah. just, yeah. you know... Yeah. So no, then I won't have to make a motion. I can, I can pull it up myself, but we're talking about pos proposed positions and looking at those. So that's, that's something, an option. So that's it, but I'm not going to discuss it now. Thank you very much. We had a few items that were pulled for discussion. Item number 19, I believe Council Member Carlson, did you pull that? Yeah. Um, Mr. Murtaugh, I, I, I just want to, I, I talked to Ms. Murtaugh, right? Mutterback, sorry, man, it's too late Mutterback. in the day. I, I call them mur mur how, how do you say it again? Mutterback. Richard Mutterback. Okay, Richard Mutterback. Sorry, my brain's family. fried. Um, so, so my concern with this, which is a discussion for another day, is we need to talk about uh, the CCNA process. We need to talk about bonding. We need to talk about service, purchase of services. What this does is it's a pre-approved list of, I think, engineers and architects, and then the, the, um, uh, the CAD department can assign them work orders up to two hundred thousand dollars, and um, and 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 as I understood it in the hall, there's no limit overall, um, and I, work orders don't have to be approved by city council, right? It, under one hundred thousand dollars, they do not anything so, over one hundred thousand. So my concern is that is that and, and you look at Hannah Avenue and also um, uh, Fair Oaks or the East Coast Park, you had. A situations where the the construction companies are paid a percentage of the deal and there's there's price escalation uh, without a discussion about the budget and uh, and 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 you know I talked to mr. Spearman about furniture a few months ago and said if somebody wants to buy five million dollars of furniture you have to have an RP right yes if they want five million more in furniture there's has to be another RP but in the case of Hannah Avenue, we went from 400,000 to 122 million without an RFP. In the case of Fair Oaks, we went from 5 million to 18 to, to um, 41 without an RFP. And so we need, we need a different process for handling this. And so I, my request to him was to delay this until after um, we talk about the CAD process and put some controls around it, just the same as we talked about with the fire station and the five and a half million dollars for affordable housing. It didn't get done because the administration didn't want to do it. Um, in this case, there's a lot of things being done. Um, the, the people of East Tampa were promised an extra $23 million on a park, and, and we didn't even know about it until after they had been promised it. So we need to put some guardrails around this so that we can be involved in the process. And, it's, and we've got a new administrator who seems to be eager to want to do it, and we've set up a meeting. Um, I asked if this could be continued till after that other discussion, and he rec is recommending no. And so, unless you all want to delay it, I'm going to just vote no. How far do you want to delay it to? What is the other? When is the other? I don't know when the other. November, November 30th, or yeah. something. So it's, it would be a December end 7th of November uh, workshop. You went. You were explaining to me earlier. You went through a process, an RFQ process, to ha to vet all these companies. But Correct. is there is there some urgent need? that we have to talk about it before November? Not an urgent need, it's just um, there's, there's 15 firms that went through the RFQ process. Um, we vetted all 15 firms and selected all 15 firms, three of which are minority, um, small local business, black, Hispanic, uh, so 20% um, of those firms that, and this just makes them available for use now. It's just putting, I mean, it's 15 additional firms that would become available uh, if, any, if any task in their in their wheelhouse, per se, comes up between now and and, and. more. Can I ask just ask Morris? Is it possible? Sorry, to put you on the spot. Is it possible to? I mean, I can be the. It can be six to one if you all want. But Morris, can we just amend it to say that City Council needs to approve the work orders? You need a charter change and a ballot I thought we do originally need to go for twenty million dollars. <clears throat> the reason why the one hundred thousand dollar limit is by code, anything over under a hundred thousand dollars does not come to council. So. Purchasing contracts, all different contracts. So there's an ordinance on the books. You'd have to amend that ordinance. And in fact, we've been looking at whether that limit needs to be adjusted upward a little bit. What is the limit of these contracts? What kind of what? Give examples of what these work order contracts are for. Are there and are there monetary limits? So council is assured that it's not going to go up to but can the I, can I just level. Say, so I just that's. But. Can I just say one thing? And th this is talking about the past, not now. And I've yeah. seen with other governments. What happens is, you issue 
like 10 different work orders for $50,000. Or we had the, the case, and I don't think it's the fire chief's fault, but the fire chief had a strategic plan that was, what was it, Nick, $99,999? And so it was just under the threshold. And, and so somehow we've got we've to come up with a solution for this. And I don't, I don't want to look at thousands of contracts <laughs> either, but when we have an open-ended check, I mean, we, 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 maybe it's limiting the total amount that will go to one firm or the number of times people get it. There's also a, um, other, other considerations, but I, I think we need to monitor this more, more closely. Not that we don't trust the new administrator, but just because we, the public uh, doesn't trust the process and we need to show transparency. Thank you. So there's no way to amend this. We would have to take a vote on it today unless we, I mean, continuing it, nothing really changes, correct? Correct. <coughs> we could, correct. We, if we delay it till December after the November 30th, the I mean, vendors. huh? The, the vendors would, should be able to participate. Yes. So then we should take a vote to, let's just take a vote today. If, if someone would like to move item number 19 and see where it goes. Do we have a motion to move item number 19 that was pulled from consent? Yes, sir. We have, uh, all right. Yeah, it is mine, but I'm not doing it. Okay. It's under uh, public works. Yeah, let's check. Charlie. Yeah, it would be counted. No, public right. works is 19, that's first. Yes, no, but I'm not but, voting for it, and Bill's not voting for it, so it would have okay, to be. Well, I'll do it. No, it would have to no, be Charlie. Charlie. Okay. Are you? Because yeah. he's next. So he so moved. Yeah, Councilman Miranda has moved item number 19. Do we have a second? Second. Second from Councilwoman Henderson. Let's yeah. take a roll call vote. <coughs> Miranda? Yes. Carlson? No. Herseth? No. Clendenin? Yes. Henderson? Yes. Maniscalco? Yes. Motion carried. Vote. <coughs> Carlson and Hertek voted no, and we are being absent as well. All right, I believe the other two that were pulled were Thank by you. Councilwoman Hertek. Yes. I believe those are yours in 29 and mm -hmm. then 32. 29. Um, <coughs> You know, I thought about this because I, I read Thank the you. agenda every week and I pull out things. Yeah. And I talked, I asked about this with staff and it's a $5,500 ice maker for the um, legal department. Well, ice and water, well, it's ice and water. The whole building. It's for the whole building, but it's behind locked doors on the no, eighth floor. It's going on the second floor. It is going on the second floor. See yeah. now, we, that wasn't what I was told. But anyway, I just, I wanted to bring this up because these are the little things that we're all gonna have to start looking at yeah. in the budget. Now, whether or not we wanna do anything about this, I'm bringing it up as a point of the little things that we all need to start looking at as wants and needs. So it's, it's something that I understand that right now, people from Old City Hall go across to T-Mob to get ice and water. I understand that, our ice here is terrible. Uh, but I'm going to let Ms. Travis advocate for this. Sure. And I'm also on the yes, line to Adrian Colina, Director of Logistics and Asset Management. Go hey, ahead, Ms. Adrian. Travis. Thank you. I forgot Adrian was calling in online, and Adrian could provide more details because it is in her budget. But I will tell you that I was the person that advocated for this for our colleagues that are in the Old City Hall building because I can look out my window of my office and see them walking over in rain to get ice water from the T-Mob building. So I advocated for my colleagues that are executive or legislative aides, the clerk's office. The legal department just happens to be the largest department in this building. We have, um, Osea Wynn has some staff in this office and communications as well. So I'll let Adri talk about the details, but this came from me advocating for my colleagues in Old City Hall for a service that they have to cross the street for T-Mob in, in whatever inclement weather is going on outside. And it's not, a, it's a, not a new budget line item, it's a, it's a transfer from one line item to another, but Adri can talk to that. Ms. Colina, go ahead. Thank you, thank you, Ms. Travis. Yes, it is simply reallocating funds that is in my existing operating budget this fiscal year um, from operating into capital. And it's funds that we said we could better use in this form. I'm not asking for any other funds, but Ms. Travis is right. We've had record breaking heat this summer. We have rain and Old City Hall does not have an ice dispenser and a water dispenser. And so I'm not asking for a luxury item. It's really a quality of life item, 
we have approximately 70 staff members in Old City Hall, with the majority of them being in the legal department. The legal department did not make this request, and we were looking at two separate areas in Old City Hall where it can be placed, and we've landed on the second floor, which is accessible to everyone, um, and it will eliminate the need for staff in that building to have to walk across the way just to get ice water. And it's going on the second floor, Councilwoman Hertek. I think there's a space on the second floor um, next, like a kitchen space that's available and it's not behind locked doors. Okay. So. Okay, and I appreciate, and it, you. I, I appreciate it, and I, I'm not saying I'm voting against it. I'm saying these are the types of things that we're going to have to be looking at next year as to how to spend. I'm not talking about this fiscal year's budget. I'm talking about next fiscal uh -huh. year's budget. And I just wanted to bring it up because I literally woke up in the middle of the night last night and went, I'm so thirsty. the ice maker. No, no it's, it's just the little things oh. that we are really going to have to do. And for me, it was a, it was a visual. So... Anyway, it's it's not my department, I don't think. It is. I will I will support this if this was a oh, soda machine. Yeah, yeah. If this was a soda machine, I would like a Coke freestyle. I would not be supporting this because I think we need to reduce our sugar intake. What about Pepsi? It, I, am, I will I'm say that, you know, thank you, thank you, Councilman. It um it is is water. No. It's water and ice. Yes, it is yes, consistent yes. with TMOB with yes. the staff in Lemon Street. It is consistent with the folks at Parks and Rec at CMOB. TPD locations, fire stations. We should not treat the staff in Old City Hall any differently. It's not a luxury item. And honestly, we put it on today's agenda, really just being transparent. Because come fiscal year 24, I would have had capital funds. I could have purchased it. But we wanted to be transparent. And that's always the case with us. And it's a better use of the money than just spending it on operating right now. And honestly, as I waited today to speak, I listened this morning to our invocation and the young man, Mr. Balloon, very accurately said, it's not about us, it's about what we can do for others. And I'm here today for my colleagues in Old City Hall, city employees who work very hard. And as public sector employees, we can't offer the perks that some private industries can, i.e. Wait, wait rooms, catered lunches, et cetera. And an ice machine and a water dispenser is not quite a perk, but it does say, it does go a long way saying, towards saying we appreciate you. And I heard Councilman Clendenin earlier, and I want to thank you when you said, public service is not a sexy job, and you're right. We are, just, or, and we're not just FTEs. We're dedicated people, and we dedicate our life to serving the public. And, and today was simply about being fair to the employees in Old City Hall. Can I get a motion to approve? Yeah, so I'll make the motion. I just, again, I wanted to bring it up as things that we're going to have to be looking at next year. That is next year, fine. we're not going to be able to afford this. So uh, I'll, I move item number 19. Do we have a second? Second. second. I moved it twice already. All right. Yeah. Council member Miranda. All right. I'm sorry, 29. No. Pardon. Oh, pardon. 29. I apologize. <laughs> You're right. No motion problem. from Councilwoman Hertex. I'm Councilman Miranda. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Thank you. That. Um, item number 32 yes. is the appropriation of $11 million uh, for personnel expenditures for, for fire and police. And we just moved a large amount of American Rescue Act dollars. And from my understanding, they were moved because we had to, we, we had to allocate them uh, because the federal government was possibly going to be p pulling those monies back. So we put them into f to, uh, public safety personnel. And when I looked through the report for AF, for the American uh, ARPA. Uh, American Rescue Plan Act, Yes, yes. All of those monies were spent. So how much money did we put into that fund? And where did that money that was supposed to go into fire rescue personnel salaries, wh where did that go? Mike Perry, budget officer. So thank you for um, the actions you took in May. Uh, we're, we're about 101% obligated on our ARPA fund, so we protected the $82 million. So I appreciate that. Uh, what we did is we took about $19 million of public safety salaries, and we reduced the, the, those public safety salaries in the general fund, and we increased the, the same public safety salaries in the ARPA operating fund. And then we moved a corresponding amount of expenses out of the general fund into the ARPA fund. So from if you were to look at the police department, not segregated by funds, 
it would be very it, it would be equal to each other so to one for one dollar now we reduced the police department's ARPA personnel and fire ARPA personnel fund and we moved them to um, I do believe the housing fund I think we put 14 million dollars there don't quote me and then we moved some money um, into the utility services tax capital construction fund to fund some capital projects so from a from a, from a budget authority perspective within the general fund, you reduced the police and fire and you increased, and you increased the transfer from the general fund so it had no net effect mm -hmm. of, on the general fund. Okay, so I guess what I would love, I would like to make a motion or maybe I don't need to make a motion, maybe you can just provide this mm -hmm. for us. Um, if, if you could just provide us <clears throat> that that uh, balance that you just explained yes, verbally uh, in a written form. So just all of that ARPA money, and I, I, um, I may have already asked uh, CFO O'Hara for this, but if you could just Yes, ma'am, staff is working on that for you. Okay, so, so yes, knowing where those funds are coming from and where they've been moved to, because if we have that kind of money sitting in housing, I'd love to know about it. Uh, and, um, so, so that was really my question, was making sure. So now we put $44 million of our $77 million, or of our $108 million we got from ARPA? $82 million. We got $82 million. 77 of those went into police and fire personnel funding. No, that's not what I said, ma'am. No, but that, but, but, oh no, I'm sorry. It's about, 44 million of that I, I went think, into, I, think you're I apologize. Pretty close. Yes. Yeah, 44 million went into that. And so I want to make sure that, that we kind of write that equation a little okay. bit and make so sure it's more equitable. You want the total history of the program? I would love the total okay. history about what's gone in and out. I read the report, but it's not as detailed in terms of um, previous years. The last year is very clear, and I greatly appreciate that. But I would love to know what got moved where just to kind of see the percentage of where we as a city, um, as someone so eloquently said, where we spend our money is about, is about our values. And I know a lot of that was um, we wanted to put in housing. So I want to make sure that it actually makes its way there at some point. Yes. And again, when we, the transaction we took in May was a one for one switch. Yes. That way we, we stayed true to the original ARPA program that council approved um, in fiscal year 22 and again in the 23 budget. Yes. So, yes, yes ma'am. And that's the only reason I brought it up is because I just wanted to know where that money went. Um, I, if we could possibly get that by the weekend, that would be great because knowing where that money's going really helps us figure out uh, where in the budget where, where we can uh, move funds. And uh, touching on that while you're here, as was mentioned this morning and has come up, and, and clarify if, if, if I'm wrong, but Five and a half million dollars that keeps coming up that was moved to solid ways that was to go to housing. Do you know off the top of your head uh, that answer, or is this a similar scenario? Um, I do believe that we moved about five point five million dollars over to solid waste capital to assist in the relocation project, and that's where those funds were. And of that amount, probably about 80 90 percent of it has been expended, but the, the remainder has been encumbered through a purchase order. So those funds are fully committed. Now, there was a discussion about relooking at the, I'm sorry, do you have a question, Mr. Chair? No, no, I thought that money that was transferred to solid waste was supposed to go to housing, unless I'm totally confused. If it wasn't used. If it wasn't, if it wasn't The words yes. were if it wasn't used. And, okay. and as, we've been, as we've been saying for um, a while now, the solid waste study, is, I mean, the solid waste department is undergoing a rate study. Um, they scheduled a, an eight-hour meeting with me the day after our workshop, so I'll be really happy there. And, and so based on that rate study, we're probably going to come back in 25 with an adjustment to the rates. Now, we've done everything to make sure that the, that the fund balance and the solid waste will remain positive through the end of 24. And if, we, if, we, if, we, if the solid waste department was to lose that money, then we'd, we'd be even more tighter. And so that's why I respectfully request we, we keep those funds in solid waste. Yes, sir. I know this isn't your area, but for anybody who's asking or who's watching, um, uh, there was a caveat in, the, in that motion that, that enabled staff to move it back. 
um, so nobody did anything wrong. I think in the future we won't have caveats like that probably, <laughs> but um, but um, it would it would be helpful. And I, if you know, we read the budget, and we see the money transferring it, but it would be helpful if somebody could flag it and clearly state verbally and or in writing that this was the money that we had thought was going to go to housing, but there was a need for it and we're moving it back. Um, if that, if that was in the documents, it was buried somewhere and none of us, I think none of us saw it. So again, nobody did anything wrong, but, um, but just in the future, if a situation like that happens, it would be great to, to communicate. And like Adrian was saying, ice maker, maybe they didn't have to put it in. Any, any transparency and discussions are very helpful. Um, the, the other thing is on, on the garbage, uh, sorry, solid waste uh, rate study, is there no chance that we can get some kind of preliminary figure before Wednesday? Again, the um, solid waste is an enterprise department, and um, those funds will probably not be part of the discussion of the general fund. But CFO, CFO was telling me when we met before that, and I might not remember exactly, that he was expecting a $12 million <laughs> deficit this year, which will be covered by the, uh, I think it was $22 million reserve fund. And so there's a chance in 2024 that if, if for some reason we run a deficit, you know, the machine breaks down or whatever, then, uh, then we could be pulling into the general fund. So I think the sooner we, um, the sooner we get the new rates set and stabilize that, the better. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Any other questions? Yes, sir. I have a question. So, and this is kind of, kind of on the same topic, but only to satisfy my own curiosity, I guess I could have done it with an off-site phone call. Why does this rate study take so long? Can you explain that? It's, it, I, I've been. You had an eight-hour meeting after the marathon budget meeting. Yeah. Poor guy. No. Poor guy. But I mean, I, but I I mean will, they've been talking about a rate study for a long time. Yeah. I, I will tell you that um, we've had some issues on validating customer headcount because what we want to do is, as solid waste is a very complicated rate process because you can go down you got carts you got compressors you got compactors you got front end loaders how many times do they pull do they pull once a week do they pull three times a week do they pull seven times a week and so a lot of that is is gathering the data and the rate consultant has the data and then what he does is he goes through and validates revenues versus what's coming through in our in our accounting system and so part of that discussion is where are the discrepancies? Because we don't want to go to a rates, issue the rates, and then have them come out not to expect what we see. So a lot of it is, is validating the data we've received from solid waste. So the, you, you use the buzzword for me, consultant. So the consultant charging us by the hour? Is that why it's taking so long? Yeah. Um, yeah. Again, every yeah. the consultants, Rev Tellus, um, it just, seems, it just seems like it's like, okay, how in the world can a rate rates that you take that long? We know how much we're spending. I, I would say that a the lot of it start? is just the city, yeah. not the oh, rate right. consultant. Okay, very good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Any other questions or comments? Do we have anybody that wishes to move this motion? This is Thank under you. Councilman Miranda's Finance Board. Committee. Motion from Councilmember Miranda, second Councilwoman Henderson. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? <laughs> Okay, that uh, concludes the pulled items. Let me just get to, um, where are we at, where are we at? All right, hold on a second, ma'am. Um, no, I took some notes here real quick. We're at 75. We have a written report transmitted by Abby Feely, but she is here in person. I'm sorry? Yeah, yeah we already went through that, the Fred Hearns, yeah. Let's get a motion to receive and file. So moved. Motion for Councilman Moran, second for Councilman Clinton. All in favor? Aye. I'm going to go to 75 now. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon, Council. Abby Feely, Deputy Administrator, Development and Growth Management. I'm here on item 75. Um, that is a report on Senate Bill 102, which we know as the Live Local Act. Um, this came before you on July 13th. And um, at that time, council made two motions. The first motion was to see what other local governments were doing related to that. And the second was to modify the memorandum which staff had put together related to the implementation of the process. 
Um, I did file a memorandum um, myself in collaboration with Dana Crosby Collier from the legal department uh, on this matter, and you do have that, and I'm here to answer any questions. Any questions, Council Member Carlson? I see your hand. Yeah, I think it, as I read it, and, I, and sorry to make you wait so long, but it's good for the public to understand because a lot of people are discussing this. Um, but but I, as I understand what you did following the input from Council, is that you all took out anything that was not specifically covered in the law and you just uh, set the new rules to, to precisely follow the law. For example, uh, maybe parking was not included in the law, but it was included in initial recommendations, but now it's out. So any anything that doesn't specifically cover the law will follow the, the existing processes. Is that correct? That is correct, but that I want to be clear that that does include design exceptions or something that a project is eligible to receive today administratively, they are still eligible to receive under this legislation. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma yes, sir? No. Yes, ma'am. I just wanted to say thank you for your work with this. I greatly appreciate it. Councilwoman Henderson? Same thing. Um, we talked about it earlier. I appreciate it. And um, so at this point, we're going to leave it as you recommended it in your first presentation from the first time, right? That's after the motion. Well, that's. I, I, I wanted to talk to you about that, um, Attorney Kate, is that the presentation that she presented. And I just want to say, unfortunately, I was not here on July 13th. I was very ill, and, and Kate and right. I had worked she <laughs> in partnership together. Yeah. And, and the objective behind what we originally did, and I don't want to belabor this or make your day any longer, was to provide a unified approach um, to the implementation of this, this program or this state legislation now that local governments are required to do in an effort to get the best housing projects that we can get um, and in order to maximize the use of our very limited lands as they come in, if they come in and when they come in. We've counseled several projects on this. Um, we have not had any formal applications as of today. I think there has been some discussion amongst the development community to see what exactly was going to come out of this discussion today. Um, so if we need to discuss any of the details of what was behind that, I am here today and I'm happy to do that in partnership with um, le the legal department. Oh, sorry, yeah. Attorney Kay, um, when you presented it, um, it was in support of how the bill was already written, right? Senate, um, it was 102, what was it called? Senate Bill 102? Yes, ma'am. On July 13th, when we presented the city's implementation of the Live Local Act, Senate Bill 102, yes. what we had included in addition to what Senate Bill 102 provided and mandated, we included the ability to seek a reduction in parking that was consistent mm -hmm. with other reductions that um, this city council and staff has approved through a design exception process. We also included the ability to reduce the green space requirements, again, consistent with other things um, we've approved before. Yes, ma'am. Yes. And the idea was instead of requiring an applicant who's interested in pursuing a project under the Live Local Act, instead of requiring them to file more than one application, we were recommending and supportive of the idea of one application that would include the ability to seek those reductions that can otherwise be sought administratively as a design exception one. Right. So the idea was one application instead of three. Consistent with council's direction on July 13th, we've amended the memorandum, removed the ability to pursue those parking and green space reductions as part of this Live Local Act application but as Abby just mentioned, the applicant can still seek those reductions administratively. They will simply have to file separate applications. Right, but that's not efficient, right? We did it at the request of council. It right, was not our recommendation. Right, okay, there we go. So in order for it to be the efficient process, it would be the initial recommendation that you presented before. Yes, ma'am. And we can do that today. We would like Through council's emotion. direction, <laughs> yeah. given the direction we got on July 13th. If it is council's direction to go back to the original approach, 
then we would again amend the memorandum and communicate that to the public. Yes, that's that's what I would like because that the efficiency um, is, I think, what's important because we asked you all to do this. You came back as the professionals with the recommendation um, initially, and you know that's what I would like to move forward on. But I'm not sure. Is that saying um, this is a neophyte situation? Is that saying that we need to write another memo for this, uh, or how do we proceed from a a motion standpoint. One thing, if I may, with sure. respect to the parking, this the Live Local Act did ask and, and did encourage local governments to look at parking reductions. Mm -hmm. So we did that. So right. that was, while it was not mandated by the Act, um, local governments were encouraged to look at the ability to reduce parking. With respect to your question, um, we would want, if if the direction is to go back to the original recommendation as presented on July 13th, we would like a motion of council. We don't need to come back with another memo. We would just go back to that original memo, but we would like a motion uh, from the city council to support that. Yeah, okay. Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, may I ask a, qual uh, um, a clarifying question? Go ahead. Sir. Thank you. In your memo, you mentioned, um, as I recall, and correct me if I'm mistaken, but there were, as you as you say, there were things that were included, the parking and the green space, and and that was a decision that was made or a recommendation that was made to do it administratively based on actions that council had previously taken that came to council? In addition to that, it was consistent with design exception ones that have been approved by staff. So it wasn't just based on council decisions, but that ability already exists to process those types of waivers administratively. The intent was simply to require one application instead of three. And yes. with regard to if, because there's a line in here and I, I just, that's what I'm asking for the clarification. The line in your memo saying that um, I believe it says that if the request for the design exception exceeds the authority of staff under the code, it will be necessary for the applicant to seek a rezoning before city council. Yes. Would that have remained the same with your initial um, proposal? Yes, sir. It will. It would yeah. have. Sure. Yes, sir. Councilman Carlson. Yeah. yeah um, so. In the four years that I've been on city council, the, um, the state legislature has constantly preempted us on all kinds of things. In fact, they preempted this city council. Uh, this city, sorry, the city council just before me um, passed a tree ordinance that took like two years of negotiation. And then the state legislature came and it preempted it just after it was passed. And that was a consensus between neighborhoods and developers who all I think Mr. Michelini was one of them who all worked hard on that and then suddenly the legislature threw it out. So um, we've seen that over and over and over again. So the community is very concerned about state preemptions. And, and my concern about this the other day is that, is that uh, if, we're, if the state imposes a preemption on us, I don't want to go beyond the state preemption and give up more uh, rights and expectations. You know, we get blamed if if uh, a developer goes in and tears down trees and then the city points to the state law or whatever and and uh and i don't want to give up more more authority without that now flip side of it is that our um our process takes too long but i don't think it's because of the council schedule because we're pretty flexible about setting up new meetings um and also um uh um there, there are some things that we could maybe simplify, but if we're going to, if we're going to put things under um, admin, I think that has to be a separate process that we hold with our community, not, not as uh, just something we tack on to a state preemption. <clears throat> if I may respond to that, Mr. Yes, Carlson, yes, the intent was not to take away any other power from this city council, and I think maybe I didn't make that clear on July 13th. The intent was simply to combine under one application what can otherwise be approved administratively by staff. And so the intent definitely was not to take away from this city council's power. And in the event that a project that seeks approval through the Live Local Act 
seeks a parking reduction greater than what can be approved administratively, seeks a green space waiver greater than what can be approved administratively, or seeks other types of modifications or waivers, those types of projects would necessarily have to come before City Council as a rezoning. So it was never staff's intent um, to take away further power from the City Council. And, and I'm not criticizing you all or blaming you. Uh, I think when, when you presented it, did Nicole help you? I don't remember. Um, uh, but when you all presented it, uh, at least for me, it, 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 I was surprised that, that, that some of those things were included. And so um, uh, I know you all work hard to brief us in advance. And um, it, it, that anyway, appreciate you all going back and redoing this. I think for right now, this, this, we're forced by the state law preemption to do what's, what, what is here. And if we want to do anything beyond that, I think we should go through a separate process. I'm not against putting more under administrative authority. Um, in fact, one of my motions that was on the agenda today, and we moved it again, is to extend the CBD. Um, there's no reason why if, if, if Water Street is going to be at the FA limit on one side of Meridian, there's no reason why the other side of Meridian can't be that way as well. And so, you know, the development community wants to see that we're trying to support them as uh, more than we reject them. And um, uh, I've also made a motion to try to allow um, maximum height limits on Dale Mabry in certain areas, um, along other corridors and in, uh, in business districts. And we need to accelerate those because the business community wants to see that we are serious about trying to help them. We see the pro-housing advocates who want to put more units on. Um, the neighborhoods, I think, are unified in saying, we're okay with you putting maximum density in the places where, where there are corridors and, and already high density. Uh, we just don't want you to put a 20-story building in the middle of Hyde Park, right? But along Kennedy, Dale Mabry, certain other quarters, we can build density and build the units we need. And so we just need to modify uh, some of the process along the way. Thank you. Councilman. Okay. Okay. Um, you know, one statement is the one I did not understand when this brought before us that it was not uh, taking away uh, council you know, rights on these decisions, that it was just administrative. So I don't know if, since it's something that's, if all you're doing, if, if I, what I hear you correctly, all you're doing is consolidating paperwork. That's yes. right. That we never see anyway. That's right. Yes. So that's why I stood up, excuse me, sorry. My yeah, the, so then, then, then I'm willing, I'm willing to, to, to make a motion to move the initial memo. Uh, she, she, she has brought it up. No, first. go ahead. You can second it. Go, go freshman. You know. I'll second it. You can second it. I don't care. Awesome. No. Go ahead. No, go. Oh, please, I'm getting old. <laughs> <laughs> that, yeah, hey, there's no EM, there, there's it's not going to, there's not going to be a medical, the ALS we, system and the fire department's we, on we order. Just, it won't be here for another year. So, so I'd like to make a motion that we um, move the initial memo that was presented on yeah. was July 13th. It? July 13th yes. um, and that's it. Second. We have a motion from Councilman Clendenin, second Councilmember. Council Member. Henderson, let's have more discussion on it. Councilwoman Hertek. Yes, um, and I completely disagree, and it's mainly because the public's not involved, and I'm never going to agree on something where that takes the public out of it. Uh, I believe that the state's going to come back with another round for this next year, and I think we should simply wait. Um, the public trust is, is not very high right now, I'm getting a lot of complaints. I have one, e one gentleman who's been emailing me every day concerns about a site that's not being responded to. And those need to be fixed before I'm willing to give, that I, before I think we should be giving more um, availability to administrative decisions. And- But Councilman, so this was published on the agenda. For public input, if they wanted to have a public in input on this issue, I'm not talking about this issue. Oh, issue. I'm okay. talking about other issues okay. within this department that um, I am struggling to get answers for um, constituents. Okay. And so what I'm saying is, uh, we clearly asked just to make it clear that we we're going to follow live local the way we need to follow it, and that the public would like to know when other issues are coming forward. Uh, to the best of its knowledge, because right now, if somebody comes to them with Live Local, not one neighborhood, not one uh, community member will be will be noticed about it. 
And that's a state, that's a, yeah, that's that's a, a state that's law, part of a state not law. us. Right? So in order to give any type of notification, that, that's the reason I asked for this. Well, I, I agree, and that's what I, was with, I was with you that day, but, that, but what I'm hearing now is that yeah. These these design exceptions, they're not going to get that notification. Yes, anyway. they would. No, no, they not, won't. not in the no. not in the design no. exception one. No, not the there's design exception one. So it really, this will be transparent not only to us, but it'll be transparent to the community See, based on what they're presenting today. I absolutely disagree again because of what I'm. I mean, I'm. And I know Ms. Travis is working with me on this, mm -hmm. but until I actually see movement, I I I cannot support anything that gives more administrative uh, power to that department. Understood. The administrative power is already there. It's just in three applications instead of one. We, and, and that's okay with me. Yeah. We, have a, we have a motion from Councilmember Clendenin, Second Councilwoman Henderson. The final discussion on the motion, sir? Yeah, I'm definitely voting against this. Um, if we want to get, as I said, if we want to uh, add more to a state preemption, we need to go to the neighborhoods and others and go through that. Um, and uh, we have motions that we pass, like that, some of which I just mentioned a minute ago. A um, couple were supposed to be on the agenda today and they keep getting bumped and bumped and bumped. Instead of adding things to a state preemption, I'd like to get the things passed that, this, that, the, that the development community and the neighborhoods want us to pass so that we can get some of this housing moving. And, and also, um, similar to Council Member Hertak, I hear a who's who of, of uh, Tampa developers and others who say that they feel like two or three developers move really fast and everybody else moves slowly and we need to fix that before we start adding things like this and this, this is not going to speed anything up. We have a motion from Councilman Clendenin, second from Councilwoman Henderson. Let's take a roll call vote. Carlson? No. Hurtak? No. Clendenin? Yes. Henderson? Yes. Via Miranda? Yes. And Manasson? Yes. Motion carried with Hertzett and Carlson voting no and the European absent. Thank you very much. Item number 77 was a motion initiated by Councilman Clendenin, but it was to be continued to a, a date. Yeah, I had it. When would you like it? December 7th is still light. It's far away. November 2nd is also available. I think we should, we're supposed to, we should continue this for further discussion to, after clarification, or are you ready to present today? So I, I think, Abby Feely, um, I think on this item, and with everything else that's come to light, then maybe we should continue this discussion for another time set time to be determined, maybe? I would appreciate that. Okay. November 2nd under staff report? Well, no, no, time to be determined. Oh, to be determined. So we'll leave it. Okay. 77, we'll just, uh, do we just yeah. move to receive Motion and file. Motion to receive and file. Motion to receive and file from Councilman Clendenin, Senator Councilman Henderson. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We're not done yet. We have item number 78. And just for clarification, there is no public comment on this no. item, correct? Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. There's enough for the clerk. Kamari pettis Michael from the legal department. Item um, on July, I'm here regarding item number 78. Um, on July 27, 2023, uh, City Council conducted a hearing to consider a recommended order um, of a hearing officer regarding FDN 22148 for the property located at 7700 West Courtney Campbell Causeway. City Council approved a motion rejecting the recommended order and directed the legal department to, to provide a revised final order. Before you is the revised final order based upon the motion of City Council. Um, if City Council agrees with this final order, um, the legal department is asking you to please pass the resolution approving and adopting the final order. I just printed a new um, final order. There was an error on the top of the header and I've corrected that that item. Yes ma'am. So I will now ask for questions from any council members but there is no public comment so basically it's just a motion to move the re resolution adopting this final order, correct? Correct, if that's the desire of council. Do we have any questions or comments from council members? So moved. We do not have any questions or comments. We have a motion from council member Miranda, second from councilwoman Henderson. Let's have a roll call vote. Clendenin? Yes. Henderson? Yes. Hertet? Yes. Vieira? Miranda? Yes. 
Carlson. Yes. And Maniscalco. Yes. Motion carried unanimously with VR being absent. Thank you very much. Thank you. The Thank copy you that I have in front of me, Ms. Uh, Pettis Mackle, do I sign it and give it to the clerk? Yes, this please. Is sufficient? This final order has been signed and it will be now filed with the clerk. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. At this time, I will entertain any new business. Do we have any new business, Council Member Randall? Yes, thank you. Last year's, I brought up the public safety impact fee uh, regarding that uh, each day about 150 individuals move to the wonderful city called Tampa, Florida. All these people need places to live. Whenever new development are built, the project pays for some kinds of impact fee, for instance, the water, the sewer, the transportation, storm water, sidewalks, and schools. So uh, why is it there one for public safety? So I want to make a motion to ask the Chief of Staff and the Legal Department to report back in November 2nd. Do you want November to say 2nd. All right. Uh, with the ability, with the city's ability to process an imposing public safety impact fee. However, since today's meeting and the other meetings, we've learned more and more that some of the items that I mentioned above water, sewer, transportation, stormwater, sidewalks, and schools hasn't been changed in many years. I would like to add that to the second part of this motion. Very good, sir. I would totally support that. And, and can, can I clarify one thing? Yeah. You've been advised several times that legally you can impose a public service impact, a public, a public safety impact fee, but there are steps that you have to follow. And, there, yes. and so, the, so what I would suggest is maybe you modify your motion to ask in November for the administration to come back about the engagement of a consultant to do the necessary impact fee study. There has to be a fee study because the statute requires that any imposition of a new impact fee has to be based on the most current localized data and then a demonstrated needs analysis. Well, also thank you so very much. Thank Can you. I add that to this motion here now, make it now? Yeah. So yes, I'd sir. like to add that the administration make contact with the appropriate individuals who do the fees on the impact studies that this come back in November 2nd or whatever day it was. Right, and that okay. would be the first step in, in trying the, to impose the steps to get, to get this done. Yes. Yeah. We have a motion from Council Member Miranda, second from Councilwoman Henderson, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you very much. I think Laura should have to write one more report. Yes, sir. Anything else? No, sir. That's enough. Yes, ma'am. Councilwoman I'm, I'm, Henderson. I'm actually done for today. Okay. Very good. Councilmember Clendenin, have you had enough? Have I, 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 should we put that to a vote? <laughs> have, have I had enough? <laughs> yes, I've had enough. You're all set. Councilwoman Hertak. Thank you. Um, I move that the agenda item request, which serves as an executive summary for each agenda item, to include a more detailed explanation of the fiscal impact for each item. So on our sire, on our reports, to get more detailed fiscal impact. So the fiscal impact statement to always include the funding source and the destination fund, including the current fund balances for each fund, both by name and account number for every item. Uh, and this shall begin at the start of FY 2024, October 1st, 2023. Second. That's a great motion. Councilwoman Hertek with the motion. Second, Councilwoman Henderson. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Anything else, ma'am? Yes. Uh, I motion for staff to present uh, on September 27th, 2023, during staff reports, responding to citizen issue with stop work order on 408 and 410 West Paris. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. What day did you say? The 27th. Oh, I'm sorry. We have a 28th. I'm sorry, 21st of September. My apologies. That's supposed to be a 21st. Okay. I'm sorry to interrupt. Because today is the 7th. I, I got those numbers confused. Yes, so no, at our next regular meeting, uh, yes. yes, please be prepared to respond to every question that has been emailed from the beginning of the email request to today, September 7th, 2023. We have a motion from Councilwoman Hertz. This is a stop work order. For an issue at 408 and 410 West Paris, um, I'm not getting any answers via email, so okay. I figured Second. I'll bring it here. Second. We have a motion from Councilwoman Hertak, Second from Councilmember Carlson. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Anything else, ma'am? No, that'll do. Councilmember Carlson, do you have anything, sir? No. Um, yeah, I have. Sorry, I took a few notes from the day. Um, similar issue, um, Davis Island Civic Association would like to put donate a tree to a park in Davis Island and uh, staff is not responding to them either. So I'd just like to make a motion to 
to ask staff to allow um, Davis Island Civic Association to put a, 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 a donate a tree in a park. By what date? No, I just want does no, I just want to ask them to do that. Does it have to be a motion? Okay. It, I mean, it, it can be it formally. So yeah, it's the answer is if it, if it's a request, if well, it's a, a request. Well, they'll let well, us know. Oh, yeah. okay. it's, it's a good faith effort. I see. Okay, I'll be doing those in the future. Though. Yes, sir. We have a, a, mem a motion from Council Member Carlson, second Council Member Miranda. All in favor? Uh, Aye. Right. Any opposed? Yes, okay. sir. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, if I could just follow up to that for, for the Councilwoman's benefit uh, and for the public's uh, and for Council generally. What happens is if, if you don't have a date on something, mm -hmm. there's really no tickler to it. It's really incumbent upon the maker of the motion to follow that process. Uh, okay. The purpose of putting it on the agenda is to ensure a, a, a uh, getting some sort of response mm -hmm. by a particular date. It could either be a written motion, which just is a receive and file, or it could have an appearance. But it also shows the public that the council member yeah, is responsive respond, to their yes. request and has Good. made a formal well, request. I like I'm confident like that. that the Davis Island Civic okay. Association is a, is a little enough. Wait, wait, I don't, I don't um, can I, uh, another one? Wait, uh, all in favor? Uh, aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that's it. Um, we have, sorry, I'm tired, so I can't remember the exact number, but we have about $9 million in CRA money with just the non rollback rate. And I would like for, to, as city council, I'd like to make a motion to ask CRA staff to tell us before three o'clock on Wednesday uh, by memo, um, how much of that uh, additional CRA money is available to be transferred to for housing. Second. We have a motion from council member Carlson, second from council member Miranda, all in favor? Before uh, the CRA meeting. Before yeah. Wednesday, 3 p.m. the workshop. Yeah. Okay, oh, the workshop, okay. Yes. Yeah, so the, so the point is that if, if out of the nine million, five million of it's allocated already, yeah. then we have four million, or if we have one million, yeah, if we have so nine, we whatever okay. the number is. I just want to know what the number is, because if we're trying to hit in the five things, if we're trying to hit a number on housing, mm -hmm. and we can say, well, here's five million more, that reduces the forty-five million we have to find. Motion, we motion from Councilmember Carlson, second from Councilmember Miranda. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Anything else, sir? Just um, the uh, Stephanie mentioned the six hundred pages of fees. I know um, staff are reticent to suggest cuts, but if I, I would just a general request if to make a motion that that staff let us know any ideas they have of fees that could be raised um, between now and um, be, before uh, 3 p.m. on Wednesday. We have a motion from Sorry. Council Member Carlson, second from Council Member Miranda. Can I? Uh, yeah. Do you have a second? Okay, yes, ma'am. Discussion. Yeah, um, just turn the microphone. That's right. Sorry, CTV, <laughs> CCTV. Okay. With this information, um, my my primary concern is fees for Parks and Rec. Mine too. No, and it's. So, okay. I know, but I, what my thought process is is that um, Administrator Wynn was very vague when she said, "Well, there are scholarships." So, I. That should be the least priority in terms of a fee raise, if they're going to address fees. And, or maybe even tell us, if they are changing fees, then where's the scholarship money coming from? That wasn't quite clear to me. Go ahead. Does, that's just part of the discussion. No, no that's a very, good, you're, it's a very good question. Just so you know that the setting of fees, a fee has to be, there has to be a study right. that. Oh, just like the other. Okay. In other words, no decisions will be made yeah, we don't by between Wednesday. now and I the see. passage of this budget on fees. It's okay. just the beginning of a process for an evaluation and then the, a determination of what the fee is. And certainly, city council has the ability. It's city council that sets the fees. Okay, I understand. So, so, I'm just so thinking about to, fees and kids. So I, I, I'm, I'm just, if I can, I'm yeah. just asking. So what you're asking for is just a preliminary overview, because obviously no decisions can be made, and it's a, and it's a time. Intensive and I'm not asking for a, I'm not asking for a report. I'm just asking for individual staff members if they have ideas um, of fees that can be raised um, to please let us know ASAP. But before three o'clock on Wednesday. Okay. So, yeah, and, I, and, it, yeah, and obviously you can make that motion. And, and if, if members of the administrative staff have ideas, that they're, they're welcome to pass them by. Just so you know, the, their the fees are fairly complex, and that. And there is, uh, I think Ms. Hertak made a motion for the Citizen uh, Budget and Finance Advisory Committee to look at the fees that the City of Tampa is charging to, to look at what can be adjusted and raised 
over the next, I think, one year period. I mean, obviously, we, uh, we understand that this is more, uh, that, that, that people want this moved quicker, that council would like to move more quickly. Very but there's some, there's some fees that it, the, the fees are based on, if it, they're regulatory fees, they have to be commensurate with the cost of regulation. So you have to figure out what the cost of regulation is. Then you have fees for services, and you have to look at that. Then you have impact fees, which are governed by state law, franchise fees, which are negotiated contracts. So that it's a compl there's no one size fits all. I'm just yeah. trying to warn council. That's, that's Thank you, Councilman Clendenin. Yeah, we've been working on that, and I've had my aide doing a lot of the mm -hmm. uh, of the digging. Um, echoing what Mr. Massey just said is that it's a lot more complex than just throwing out a figure because of uh, state law. You know, fees can't be dis taxes in disguise. Uh, there's also there's there's a uh, you have to step it in. There's only you can only raise the fees by a certain percent, some fees a certain percent each year for X number of time to, to get to that point. So yeah, we can and we can only recoup the cost. A fee can only recoup the cost of actually providing that government services plus some admin fee. Um, so we have been we've been in fact I think Tim may have reached out to you. Yeah, I talked and, to Tim. And uh, we've been talking to the chief of staff about coordinating with department heads because also reference and I, I know we had we, we all unanimously supported that resolution about the budget and finance committee i think part of the problem with it, because this is so complex it's uh, there's a lot of administrative work that needs to be done to give them the information they need to be able to to really make recommendations because so the the administration i think is responsible they have to go through and do these studies and I believe that they're, and they have to, each one of these department heads has to look through every one of those departments, identify the fees, identify what the actual cost of services are, the, and plus the administration fee, and then submit that. And then we have to, then we have to figure out what we can raise immediately versus what we have to stagger in. So it's, I think once we get that done, I think the Budget and Finance Committee will have the data and the information that they can do the what their job would be as far as a citizen advisory committee to do those type of recommendations based on impact of the city and some of the parks and rec stuff and things like that but i i believe in fact i, I was going to try to get that to new business today to encapsulate everything that i just said in a motion but it's more complex so i'm anticipating bringing that next week to give the administration direction on accomplishing that task so to kind of clarify and kind of bring it all to bring it all in. So that's I'm, I'm looking at doing that. All, all, all I'm doing is a general request I to see your ask. Hand. Yeah, sorry. I see your hand. I'm just asking a general request to say anybody who's listening, uh, call us if you have an idea. Councilwoman Hertek. Thank you. And that's actually the only thing I was asking the Citizens Budget Advisory Committee to do is look through and pull the ones that they 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 think are the best and most important. And so that takes us out of it and it, it puts it in the hands of the public to, to focus on the things they want to see first. And then obviously it has to go through this whole system, but uh, I figured members of the public who are very well versed in the budget will be a good first line. Yes. Yeah, but yeah, identifying this thing is literally the tip of the iceberg. Understandable, yeah. but that's at least something that is taken off our plate right. yes. and put onto uh, the well, public to, who's, who's so. well aware. I want to put it on the administration's plate. We well, <laughs> yes, but we have a motion and we have a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? There's a, more? sorry, two two more. The, um, Morris, somebody I was I was in a forum the other day, and somebody brought up that we never raised the um, sidewalk fee, the in lieu of fee. We had several conversations about this. this is like the this public safety uh, thing. I just remember this. Sorry, but. Um, there, there was conversation, and, and it was frankly the whole fee adjustment was dropped when you all closed the loophole. The issue with in, increasing the sidewalk and lieu fee that came up is that the builders associate with the amount that the administration recommended raising the fee created issues with the builders associations. The builders association claimed, and there is some, it's not abundantly clear, I'll, I'll be quite honest, that the in lieu fee is in essence an impact fee. If it is an impact fee, then in order to raise it, there are certain hoops we have to go through. So my suggestion is if you want to look at that issue again, maybe the two, my, two, my two suggestions would be is perhaps have the administration meet with the Builders Association again to see if we can come up with, uh, come up with a compromise raise in the amount so it's adjusted so they don't legally challenge that. Or if, if we want to push it to the max, which is then we need to be either prepared to, to litigate it or go through the impact fee so what uh, what should I ask for? Steps. What what should I make a motion for? Um, I would make a motion um, 
for the uh, administration to meet with the Builders Association uh, uh, and come back with a recommendation on a on an adjustment to the sidewalk and loop fee, and that would start this, the conversation again. Okay, I move that for November second. And you put it in a sentence. I know, uh, but, but your your attorney Cammy Corbett made that argument. You want to so that was, withhold that's your more. motion? I think it fits right under all that. When is that coming? Oh, okay, okay. Never mind. Okay, I'm sorry, I missed that. Okay, so it's already it's already been done. Okay, that's okay, fine. Hey, we'll come uh, back with that. One one last last thing. Um, the city brags a lot about its credit rating. I've actually talked to people who used to work for credit rating agencies. And um, uh, you know, one of the things that will hurt our credit rating is if um, we don't have a budget. So as I understand it legally, if we don't approve a budget before the end of the month, um, then we go into the, to the last budget. But then that sends a signal to the, um, to the uh, bonding agencies that, that um, something's wrong. So. Um, I hope that the, as I said before, I hope that the administration wants to collaborate and that they want to avoid this just like we would. The decision on the ad valorem rate has already been made. We are where we are and we need to work together uh, to try to avoid that situation. But Morris, I would recommend, because of the noticing and everything, I would recommend that we set up a backup meeting on September 26. Hopefully, hopefully the administration works with us and my ideal situation is that somebody in the administration gives um, all the people who voted no uh, 15 million each that they can save. They make a motion and we walk out in five minutes. But if that doesn't happen or we don't come to an agreement, we need a backup date and we can't go past the end of the month. We can set that, I believe, on the 19th if we absolutely have to. I, as I read the statute, the only reason we could ask for a backup date is an emergency. I guess we could say a, a deadlock is an emergency, but Typically, what the, the legislature looks at, at as emergencies are things like Hurricane Lee out in the Atlantic and that sort of thing. Well, we can or, set that up on the 19th. But, but we, can, we, can set, we, can, we can set it up and advertise it in time. Could we've, I, we've, we've, we've looked at those dates. So. But could I just suggest everybody that we hold, it to, we did it on Tuesday and Wednesday, but I suggest that we do uh, September 26th and we all just hold that date even if we don't officially make a motion to hold it. That, that's fine if you want it, to hold the whole, make sure the date's held, but I wouldn't make a motion at this time. I, I think, okay, no. thank you, I'm done. Don't make a motion at this time. Let me just look at this calendar. Yeah. Um, well, this room will be used, but they'll just have to move. I'm, fr I'm free after 1 p.m. and I have nothing, so I'll be here regardless. Yep, that's... No, it, this is a commitment. Yeah. All right, so no motion. Yes, ma'am? I just had a quick question. Did we make a motion about trees? Or I'm sorry, yeah, about the sidewalk in Luffy. It's included in his yes, it's all Okay, on, it yeah. already is included because I want to make sure the stakeholders yes. are in the citizen yes. stakeholders and not just the Builders Association. Right. I think we already received uh, yeah. oh, nothing. Uh, thank you very much. So uh, I was this. I'm thinking out loud. I'm making a motion. Last year it came up about increasing the salaries of city city council. It was voted down. I was one of those people that voted it down, and we we are stuck with the. We are stuck. We get a three percent increase every year, correct? The administration determines, I believe, Morris. But the administration determines what the what the and you get what what the administration gives to the general. I believe staff. the way it works is that if if a cost of living adjustment is made, and, and that's not mandatory, but that that happens more often than not, or has typically outside of the the recession years, yes. then you would all would get a cost of living adjustment that's equal to 3%. That's my, is my recollection of what okay. the resolution is. So. Now, does that apply across the board to non-union employees? You would get it, you get it only if it applies across so the board, all managerial. So department heads, you yeah, know, correct. higher salaries, are they capped at that 3%? I believe that, that generally they, I don't know if that, I can't tell you if that's the absolute cap for all managerial staff, but I can tell you that the upper managerial staff of the city, it's generally 3% or less is what, it, what, what is given out. Okay, so. no, I was just thinking, uh, as we're looking at dollars and whatnot, if, you know, and this is existing employees, this is a non-unionized, so anyways. We can always cut our salaries in half. Uh, no. Um, in the, it, yes. I'll go, and just so you all, the, the item that uh, Councilman Vieira continued yeah. is a proposed ordinance that would codify what has been done historically uh, based on a resolution that was done back in, I believe, in the 90s, yeah. where if the managerial staff of the city got a cost of living adjustment, you also got one 
but it was capped at 3% of your salary, that's codified. And then it also says that if you, if another, if, if, and what the charter requires is that any adjustment to your salary or to her salary, um, that would have to be approved by a majority of you all and by the mayor, both. If that happens, then that, what, what Councilman Vieira has, has requested, that, don't, that doesn't take place until the next council comes into session, basically, and that's what that yeah, ordinance so would I just had, a, just had a thought. Uh, what were you going to add to it? Yeah, I was just going to say, um, uh, I think City Council is, is paid way too low. The, the, um, the, uh, the, um, the public has said that as well. Um, uh, when it, um, the administration went after me on this, they, they, they offered us a, an increase. I voted for it, but then said I wouldn't take it okay. if it went through. And then they sent three mailers out on me. And guess what? They didn't work. They didn't work. And so they can say whatever they want about me doing that. And I will advocate again today, city council needs to make more money. And I, I might not accept it, but, um, but, but here's the thing. Um, well, I tried to make a, a how did this how did this get into that? I'm, I'm just thinking about I know I'm thinking about in lieu of Wednesday coming up making sure that nobody's getting some crazy increase in the city when you know we but we, be at 3%, we, we as we're looking at we, we, yeah no they are we're, we're giving like 10 percent raises that's what I'm saying so you're why gonna have yeah you have why? to go through all of the yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. so no 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 I mean um, some people are getting yeah. serious raises that's yeah. why we're moving up from I think it was like 46 million in um, increases la in so. personnel costs last year and this year it's 54. So yeah, no, we're we're going exponentially and that's we are going to have to discuss that. Yeah, that's, that's the, what I'm uh, and, and we could talk, this is probably better for a conversation on Wednesday when yes. when yes. when revenue and finance staff is here and others are here. But a lot of the salary adjustments are based on the collective bargaining agreements that mm -hmm. have been approved. And so that that creates potential I'm issues. Non, I'm yeah. talking about non union. Correct. Yeah. Gotcha. By the way, the public the public agrees like as they were sending out those mailers People in the public, every forum I went to, they said, you're right. You should support it more. And so the, if we want good government in the future, because this is already a full-time job that is, is paid very little, if we want good government in the future, we need to pass something. And even if Lewis's uh, memo passes, uh, we need to make sure that the next city council is paid more. I'm not, I'm, I'm termed out. So this is not about me. It's about good government. The mayor's making like $180,000 a year. Our aides are making 89. 80 or 90, and city council is making like 53. And that's not every every. If you look at all the best governments in the world, they all pay people well. In Singapore, they pay uh, the same wages as the private sector because they don't want people to steal anything. And and <coughs> you need you need the public to to uh, to. Um, I mean, we had a we had a colleague in the past who demanded free tickets at, at events when you had to pay two or three hundred dollars. And 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 we need city council members to not have to ask for freebies and potentially break ethics rules. We need to make sure that people are paid well so that we can, uh, we can all um, look at the public and know that we're doing the right thing. It's expensive to, to be on city council. We have to pay to go to a lot of events. <laughs> it's worth every penny I get. Yes, I paid $30 to park today to go to an event that I was invited to. It made me really Where did sad. You go pay? Where did you pay that? The Marriott, they went up on their price by $5. Oh, um, the, the Fave Summit, the Automotive Summit. Right. And I will say that city council makes less than teachers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the teachers in Hillsborough County are ranked in the bottom quartile of salaries in the United teachers States. Teachers deserve a lot. Yeah. Believe me, with the yeah. sacrifices that educators and teachers make. But also paying a lot, 70, I think the mayor proposed $70,000 or something like that. That was, um, I was surprised that you all rejected it and the people who rejected it. I actually would like to hear on the day is why did you reject it um, just for the public? But not today. Oh, no, but, not today. <laughs> but not today. Not yeah, today. Not oh, today. okay, fine. But we, we can't talk about it. Um, well, you, you can't talk about it offline. We can't talk about it offline. No, no, so no, why not sunshine, today? That's a sunshine issue. Right. So why not today? It's, well, it, it, my okay, motion to receive it's, it's no, 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 I have a real motion. Let's um, talk about it when it, when Lewis is a agenda. Okay. It goes yeah, 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 but I want to know why you voted now. I don't know. I'll tell you real quick. I'll tell you real quick. I didn't come here for the money. I knew what I was getting into. I said okay. I can, and people have told me, hey, you can make more here. You know, you speak multiple languages. You can go here. I have committed to wanting to do this since 2010. That's when I got involved in politics. I ran. I lost. And it was never about the money. It was people that inspired me to serve, former Mayor Dick Greco, Councilmember Charlie Miranda, who's been here for a long time, people that I admired. I wanted to 
give back to my community. And I knew, oh, this is the sad. And back then it was like 43. And when I was in college, when I first thought about, thought about it, it was like 26. And I wanted to go to law school and everything, but I, I knew what I was getting into. And, and that was it. I just, you know, and especially, you know, when, when people are struggling and people are trying to pay rent and everything, I, I couldn't support a, a raise. And that's just, that's just me. So, so that was it. Okay, I was I have, just curious why you, I didn't know if it was for political reasons, no, because it was no. prior to the election or why, but. No, no, no. Um, There's politics involved in this? No. no. <laughs> Shocking. Um, it's not I, enough money to be political, but. Okay. No, no, but I, I have a, I do have a motion and it's for. Um, I'm sorry, I, would you like to be recognized? Yes, yes. yes. go yes, ahead. Sir. Yes. Chairman Menescalco, you're speak. recognized. Motion for city planning staff to appear and provide an update on the housing needs assessment at the 928 workshop, which is already. Discussing housing, um, I have a lot of questions. I know we're going to have a major discussion here about we, you know, housing needs is one thing. Uh, how we can build more, how we can increase the density, how we can allow for ADUs, triplexes, quads, yes. everything that we need to do in um, adjusting this land development code to meet the needs of, of what we have in housing. Okay. Okay. We have a motion. Uh, do we have a second? Miranda seconded. Okay. We have a motion. We have a motion from Councilman. Yeah, we will. Okay, we have a motion from Councilman Maniscalco, a second from Councilman Miranda. Is there any discussion? Councilwoman Hertek. Yes, uh, I just wanted to say in the context of public safety we were talking about today, you know one of the, well, do you know one of the best ways to reduce the need for public safety? Housing. One of the citizens said it in his public comments as well. Yeah, and, and so as we look at that budget for uh, police and fire, knowing that they're reaching out to the homeless community, people who are on the edge, if those people are housed, we have, they have much less chance of being called. So mm -hmm. just wanna throw that out there. And uh, knowing that as we put funding toward housing, we are actually putting, pub uh, putting funding toward public safety. I would agree. All right, did we schedule for you to present it? Uh, no, but I will, I will try to talk about it a little bit on Wednesday. Is there any further discussion? <sighs> yes, sir, you may. Thank you. Martin Shelby, City Council Attorney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman Pro Tem. Just for Council's edification and preparation, on the September 28th workshop, with this item, you have 15 items on the workshop. But uh, many are housing related, so they are. It, 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 it can go concurrently just and smoothly. One, just to be mindful, and that there's a 5 o'clock meeting with the multiple plan amendments, just so that you'll be able to be prepared yeah. for that. Oh, I know. So, Thank so, you. I, I, so I don't want to hear any like huffing and puffing for somebody who wants to get out early on no. that meeting. No, I said September <laughs> is going to be a month. It is yeah. going to be a month. Okay, so we have a motion on the floor from Councilman uh, Maniscalco, a second from Councilman uh, Miranda. And uh, let's see, just all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Aye. Motion to receive and file. Mr. Shelby, <laughs> second. <laughs> Mr. Shelby, receive and file. Vote, please just be reminded so that the public is clear and certainly I certainly hope the council is clear that your next meeting is the special call workshop oh my next no action will be next taken. Wednesday yes at 3 p.m. Yes. at this location 315 East Kennedy Boulevard and again no official action will be taken Correct. we have a motion to receive and file from Councilwoman Henderson the second is um, from second. Carlson Carlson with the second all in favor aye, aye. it's been fun adjourned. sparring with you all today could be a breeze blowing through the house. This house has 34 windows in all. The front facade